So, good morning, everybody. Uh, on new genetic engineering in agriculture between flying high expectations and, and complex risk. Um, this event is hosted by the S&D Greens and Left Group, and we have participants here in the room. Welcome, everybody, and also a lot of people online. Um, there is interpretation available from, in from and to English and German. So online, you can uh, press the floor. Uh, if you see somewhere floor, then you can select <coughs> the language. And here, of course, just plug in your headphones. Um, we will start the morning with a, a presentation by Test Biotech on their new report on technology assessment. And uh, after the coffee break at 10.30, we will have a panelist of experts and stakeholders uh, to react on this and to give their own views to the topic. And also, we hope to have some time for uh, uh, discussion uh, here in the room, but also online. So online, people can post their questions in the chat if they have any, and we, uh, we hope to have time to, to take these. Uh, the event will be recorded and will be available uh, a bit shortly online. Uh, watch out for tweets of Mr. Heisling and of Test Biotech. They will uh, tweet the link. Um, so unfortunately, uh, the two MEPs from the S&D and the left group who have co-hosted the event uh, have unfortunately not been able to be here today. Mr. Pascal Durand from S&D from France and Mr. Ms. Anja Hazekamp uh, from the left group and the Party for the Animals. Um, but uh, they will <coughs> definitely watch the recording and send their greetings. But now I'd like to introduce you to Martin Heusling, uh, the Greens MEP. He's been uh, um, an uh, organic farmer and also a uh, member of parliament since 2009, uh, working towards a sustainable agriculture. Please, Mr. Heisling. So I make my speech in German, so we need translation maybe. Yeah, uh, vielen Dank. Uh, Thank you for being so numerous. Uh, here we have 140 people also connected online. So great uh, focus and attention paid to this event. And we are close to the presentation by the Commission on the new genetic engineering uh, that uh, will be held uh, June the 7th. So uh, it is a good opportunity to discuss this ahead of time to give some recommendations on the Commission not to do. I have been a member of the European Parliament since 2009. I am a spokesperson for the Greens for Agricultural Policy, and uh, I have been a, a farmer for many years now. And uh, I, I never had to do with genetic engineering, and this will be also true for the future. And this is why the organic um, in sector is important. We should also uh, search the risks, and people will be um, speaking about this later. Because when we talk about genetic engineering, emotions go through the roof. Also, when uh, posts are published on social media, there are people who blame you because you are against, or there are people who speak about risks. Uh, hopefully, our discussion today is going to be very technical and ba fact based. We do not want uh, to. Um, feed fears, but we want to make strides forward. We have um, compiled a facts check recently, both in English and Germany, where we collected data on new genetic engineering. And you can have a look at it. You can download it, what it is all about. I uh, stated this already. With respect to what the European Court of Justice stated in 2007, new technologies are uh, genetic, uh, deal with genetic engineering. And the, the German uh, law also laid down that these products would be labeled as such. Uh, the European Commission wants 
to introduce a deregulation, wants to avoid labeling. So people want to know whether that is genetically edited or not, genetically engineered or not. It is not that genetic engineering can solve all future challenges and meet all future challenges in the field of agriculture because there are going to be plants which adapt to climate change, which needs less water. This might be utopian, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, we'll hear from our speakers later. On my side, um, if things were that simple that you could uh, take or add a gene and solve problems, so then uh, we would have uh, miracles. But uh, uh, genetic engineering uh, promised a lot of things that it could not uh, fulfill, uh, and we know that already. And nowadays, if we exclude some new grains in Latin America or other plants in the United States, pesticides are needed more and more because nature counters this human intervention, but I don't want to steal too much of your time because we must give a room for our discussion. So um, we should be asking ourselves, uh, uh, is the risk too high um, with the regulation? Uh, is it profitable for farmers? Uh, last week, uh, we had a discussion on this topic and uh, it was clearly stated uh, Germany and other countries stated very clearly that they are against the deregulation. Shortly, there is going to be a discussion a hearing in Parliament about this. I look forward to what will be discussed today. And thank you very much, Corinne, for being a moderator of this session. Thank you very much. Um, so indeed, we will go now first to um, uh, test biotech. Uh, we have three uh, experts of this institute um, uh, with us today. So this is an institute for independent impact assessment of uh, genetic engineering. So both the older and the newer techniques, maybe a slight note on that. You will hear the abbreviation NGT a lot, which stands for new genomic technique. Uh, so you can think about these techniques like CRISPR-Cas, cisgenesis. Um, so the test biotech, they evaluate scientific publications in this field uh, and um, they analyze the, risk, uh, sorry, the risks for uh, environment and health and, and pro provide a counterbalance to uh, much of the industry generated knowledge in this way. So first I'd like to give the floor to Astrid Oesterreicher who will uh, um, present a little bit. Um, you have the floor, Astrid. Thank you. Um, could you please uh, put up the slides? Okay, thank you very much for having me. Uh, thanks also to the co-hosting MEPs, uh, Mr. Häusling, uh, Mr. Durand and Mrs. Hasekamp for making this event possible today. And uh, thank you for giving me the floor. I'm going to give an overview of how we expect the issue of sustainability to be approached in the upcoming legislative proposal by the European Commission. It's of course a big responsibility to present this since the Commission is also in the room and they maybe would have presented things differently. Uh, but uh, Mr. Behrendt will also have the floor later on to present the perspective of the Commission. So. Uh, I'll now present our view. Just to make sure. Ah, okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm just checking where the slide is working. A little technical problem. Um, anyways, I will already start and uh, the slides will come up. Okay, so in April 2021, the Commission presented its study on new 
genomic techniques, which was laying the ground for a deregulation of these techniques, which are currently regulated under uh, the EU's GMO Directive 2001-18, which is based on the precautionary principle and which entails, as Mr. Häusling has already pointed out, uh, risk assessment, traceability and labelling. Under the Commission plans, we expect that risk assessment would only be applied to some NGTs in the future. So that would be a deregulation. It's working now, so that's great. Um, in the study by the Commission, sustainability is put forward as the main argument why these techniques should be deregulated. I have here a quote from the Commission which says that plants obtained by NGTs have the potential to contribute to the objectives of the European Green Deal for a more resilient and sustainable agri-food system. There are a variety of different claims that are also put forward by industry stakeholders that are repeated by the Commission, including, for instance, that NGTs could bring benefits for health, the environment, food security, and help agriculture adapt to climate change. To summarize, the Commission gives the impression that the claimed benefits of NGTs are already a given fact. There is also a discussion about labeling. Uh, the Commission suggested that in the future products could carry a sustainability label to inform consumers about the sustainability contribution of the respective NGT plants or products. Um, this is an invitation to a high-level event organized by the Commission in 2021, which makes it even clearer in which direction we're going. It includes very bold statements. It says that new genomic techniques are the way forward for safe and sustainable innovation in the agri-food sector, as if the safety and sustainability of NGTs had already been proven. From our perspective, we agree that NGTs do carry a big potential for genetic changes. However, it is not easy to translate this potential into actual benefits. The promises that are currently made seem exaggerated to us. It remains to be seen whether in the future there will be NGT plants that deliver on the promises that we hear in Brussels every day. We don't say it's impossible, we only say it remains to be seen. Also, I'd like to point out that the risks of these techniques are currently not taken into account sufficiently by Commission and EFSA. In our view, in NGT crops would have to be safe for health and environment and also bring real benefits for food systems at the same time. Now, if these crops carry a sustainability potential, the big question is, of course, how to define and measure sustainability. And that's the main topic of our conference today. So, in its study from April 2021, the Commission says that risk assessment procedures, such as currently in place for GMOs, are not the right tool to measure sustainability, and that a separate mechanism is needed. We agree with this assessment. For the moment, however, there is no established framework to make evidence-based decisions about the potential sustainability contribution. The details of such a mechanism would be crucial. Up to now, however, not much is known on what this mechanism would look like. The consultations carried out last year by the Commission make us think that the focus will be on the characteristics of plants. Here is a screenshot from the public consultation that was carried out last year. <clears throat> what is interesting to note is that the question is not whether these plants can contribute, that is taken as a fact. Instead, stakeholders are asked to rank the importance of different traits and characteristics, for example, resistance to abiotic or biotic stress, or resistance to pesticides. The way the questions were formulated has been criticized as biased because in this way the Commission accepts marketing claims by companies as a fact. 
Of course, this is not a scientific or evidence-based way of going about things. It is just asking for opinions. That is also why we as Test Biotech answered that we do not know, because there are currently no standards or criteria available to assess these supposed benefits. Also, sustainability cannot be boiled down to the traits of plants. A larger perspective is needed to encompass possible socio-economic consequences through patents, for example. With this, I would like to close and hand over to my colleagues who will explore some ideas on how to distinguish between empty promises and real possible benefits. Thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> indeed. Mrs. Oestreich, thanks a oh. lot. I understand that there are some technical questions about the online participation, but I think our technical team is working on it, so they will inform you in the chat. Um, and now I would like to give the floor to uh, two other speakers of Test Biotech. I'm sorry, Astrid, I did not properly introduce you, but you are a policy advisor uh, as the, at Test Biotech. And now we give the floor to a shared presentation by Dr. Matthias Juhas and Dr. Christoph Kehn, who um, Dr. Matthias Juhas has a scientific background in plant physiology and is working as, at Test Biotech as a research, uh, research associate in a project on systemic risk, sustainability and technology assessment of genetic engineering and Dr. Christoph Thien has a background in veterinary medicine. He's one of the co-founders of Test Biotech and has authored many publications in this field and is also involved in the international organization No Patents on Seeds. So I think Dr. Thien will start and uh, Dr. Juhas will take over. Uh, thank you very much. So thanks also from my side for this uh event, uh, organizing it, inviting us and listening to us and having interest in our recent findings. And I now try to present the report, which is published today. And can you please uh, yes, share the other slides? So this is the title of the report, um, High Expectations, the same as the conference here. And I will try to take you through the first part now. And please, next slide. Oh, sorry, I have, can do it by myself. I'm uh, technical experience here. So um, first slide will be uh, what is um, technology assessment at all? What, uh, what is, have, do we have to understand? Thanks. Uh, and um, so um, in general, in the European Union, we have two pillars of GMO regulation uh, under the premise of the precautionary principle. And so we have the risk assessment, which has to assess specific events, GMOs, plants, whatever, organisms, genetically engineered organisms that are uh, regarding the intended and unintended genetic changes, direct and indirect effects, immediate, delayed and long-term accumulative effects. This is uh, more or less the wording from the current GMO regulation. And today we are not talking too much about this risk assessment, we are more talking about the risk management. And this is the political decision making and this is uh, the task of the European Commission and they can take a broader view, they can go beyond the risk of specific events and have a more a broader picture, also introduce in the decision making, uh, monitoring uh, criteria on sustainability, ethics and socioeconomics and also on technology assessment. And there is already in the current GMO regulation, it's foreseen that the Commission, that the risk manager can do more than just take into account the risk assessment. And both risk assessment and risk management under the current GMO regulation have to follow the precautionary principle. In the end, we would suppose them to act as a radar. So it's 360 degree look around, all taking all things into account, which might go wrong under the precautionary principle before um, allowing something to enter the market or the food production system. And the... Um, TA covers a wide range of issues we hear because it was shortest definition we found from the US Accountability Service um, from 21. Um, it says that new technologies can have a range of a wide range of effects, potentially both positive and disruptive, and TA can explore these. Um, and it's broadly defined in here as a thorough and balanced analysis of significant primary, secondary, indirect, and delayed interactions of a technological intervention with society, the environment, the economy, and the present and foreseen consequences and effects of those interactions. So we would very much adhere to this definition 
I think this is a very useful starting point for the discussion. And also we want to make a distinction between two pillars or two levels of technology assessment. One is the prospective technology assessment, taking the whole technology into account before it's introduced into the market. So all aspects which are relevant, as defined by Gao, before it's entering the market. So this would be now the case. Had to be now, had to be do, had to be done right now because we do not have many of these products already on the market. So this would be now the right moment for having a prospective technology assessment, also before a new kind of regulation would be introduced. And the second thing is a technology of specific applications or events or organisms. So there might be something, for example, like a checking list, whether these organisms are really meant to solve the problems which are claimed, or whether these are just empty promises or maybe true potentials. So this would mean then go to the level of the precise application. And both, from our perspective, should be taken into account. And uh, we coming from the experience of transgenic plants, 30 years ago, it was accompanied by many promises and benefits, high expectations. Most of them do not have or only partially been realized. At the same time, there have been hardly any systematic or independent studies to objectively assess the actual impact of the transgenic plants on agriculture. For herbicide use, uh, the insecticidal toxins and the adaptation of pest insects, the uh, spread of the plants, the gene flow, and also the patents issues are major aspects, which are not part only of the risk assessment, but of a technology assessment, and which never have been taken into account so far in a systematic way. And to avoid this now, we think um, we should introduce this now for at least for um, entities because we think entities are much more powerful. They have a much broader range of possible applications. The promises are even raised on a higher level than before. And we still, we have some things which we think goes beyond risk assessment, like plants uh, which may not show, uh, which, which might have show, show extreme traits, like having a reduction in certain gluten or acrylamide content by baking, but having a reduced um, plant vitality, if, if supposed to be grown, this is a problem then for the farmer and the breeder, or animal welfare aspects, which we see on fishes, which are already marketed in Japan, or um, or patents. This is still an, 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 an ongoing issue. Um, also now with NGTs, and um, the oil seed grape is supposed to show that there are unintended effects, which not only are relevant for risk assessment, but also for downstream effects for breeding. If you accumulate these unintended effects, this will become a major problem for the breeders, maybe for the farmers. And we also have the problems that we might release a large bunch of these uh, genetically engineered organisms into the environment within a short period of time. And then these NGTs might start to interact with each other. And there is no scientific methodology in place to predict the outcome of these interactions. So we, we think this also has to be taken into account at early stage by the risk manager. And now I think I'm at the end of my first slides and I hand over to Matthias to give you an insight on the experience with transgenic plants in much more detail. And then I will come back on some NGTs, NGT issues. Thank you very much. So thank you, Christoph, and also thank you for the invitation. Um, as Christoph already mentioned, uh, the introduction of transgenic plants was originally uh, justified by the potential benefits for agriculture, plant breeding and uh, food security. However, um, developments fell far short from what was predicted. So far, until now, only very few transgenic traits have been brought to the market, which are almost exclusively uh, herbicide resistances or the uh, production of insecticides. So in the following section, I will give you uh, some examples why uh, prospective technology as assessment would have been needed in order uh, to prevent uh, misguided um, uh, developments or misjudgments in the future and at the same time uh, focus on the systemic effects. So the main problem uh, with the evaluation of transgenic plants can be showed by a frequently cited uh, META study from 2014. And this study is uh, purportedly showing that the cultivation of genetically engineered crops has reduced the use of pesticides worldwide by 37%, increased the crop yields by 22%, increased farmers' profits by 68%, and these effects are said to be observed in all countries uh, growing transgenic plants. Um, however, um, uh, transgenic plants... 
sorry. Um, I, I skipped to the next slide. No. Um, sorry, however, um, in the uh, plants growing transgenic uh, plants, um, it is uh, maybe I missed the text, so I skip over. So the, uh, the criteria that are ne necessary for this um, um, for evaluation um, are, for example, how long have the plants already been cultivated? As uh, for some plants, it is um, possible that the uh, um, progress is only um, visible in the first few years um, since um, the um, since the um, resistance of the weeds and the um, um, uh, and the pests have not been established so far. And another thing is, uh, it is important which seeds were used, since it is possible that um, plant breeding uh, progress on the field is uh, only evident on the field and is uh, not directly related to gen genetic engineering. Another question is, what management systems were available? Since uh, farmers using uh, transgenic plants um, have uh, using transgenic plants um, um, sorry I'm maybe missed uh, some of the text maybe they have more advice available. yeah um, they have um, more advice on the fields and uh, they used uh, more fertilizer and irrigated more strongly and uh, an additional impact is or question is in which markets as applicable higher sales revenues were achieved um, since it is possible that for some products um, the, there is a uh, higher demand and that's why also the revenues uh, achieved are more high. So it is obvious that uh, sufficiently de defined criteria and methods for assessing the systemic impact of transgenic plants are largely lacking. And this highlights uh, the need for the uh, development of, a, uh, of appropriate tools for an additional and um, um, a prospective uh, technology as assessment um, in order and also in regard to the possible use of uh, trends of new genomic of plants derived from, from new genomic te techniques in the future. So likewise, it uh, is also necessary um, to establish a reasonable ways to uh, compare contradicting findings. Since, according to Benbrook, the spread of glyphosate-resistant weeds in the U.S. has increased costs for maize and soybean cultivation by 50 to 100 percent. And according to Service, um, as a result of the dramatically rising costs, cotton production in several U.S. states declined by 60 to 70 percent. And similar differentiated reports on lower yields, rising costs, and lower returns are also available for BT cotton in China, India, and South Africa, as well as for other transgenic, transgenic crops at the global level. So therefore, it is uh, really important to, to, um, to, st to distinguish carefully which data are relevant and uh, reliable. Um, so... In the aforementioned study, um, it is claimed that they uh, included all relevant uh, studies until the year 2014, which dealt with the, um, with the cultivation of transgenic crops um, like soybean, cotton, and maize worldwide, and they state, the study reveals robust evidence on GE crop benefits for farmers in developed and developing countries. However, um, among other studies, Official data made available by the U.S. Department of Agriculture show different findings. So um, by showing the cotton production in the U.S. as an ex example, um, here you can see that the development of the operational costs um, has uh, constantly been rising, while uh, the actual value of cotton production um, during this time was uh, um, varying significantly. Um, whereby one has to keep in mind that... Um, the adoption rate of transgenic crops has also increased during this time and from 2010 um, was reaching over 90%. So um, in terms of cost developments and uh, profit expectations, um, this is an example that uh, contradicts the statement that uh, transgenic plants are being beneficial uh, in all countries growing transgenic plants. 
Um, furthermore, many studies come to, to the conclusion that after the introduction of herbicide-resistant uh, plants, the uh, overall use of uh, herbicides has increased significantly, especially in North and South America. And um, this is uh, due to the, um, develop, uh, to, to the spread of uh, herbicide-resistant weeds and uh, especially to glyphosate. And when Monsanto was uh, applying for an, the cultivation of a, gl a glyphosate-resistant maize in the year 2000, um, some experts already warned that the um, weeds could quickly become resistant to the herbicide. But Monsanto could convince the U.S. authorities by stating, although it cannot be stated that the evolution of res resistance to glyphosate resist uh, will not occur, the development of weed resistance to glyphosate is expected to be a very rare event. But this forecast was obviously wrong, as uh, you can see in the weed science database chart below, um, showing the number of resistant species um, against uh, individual uh, active herbicides. Um, and as you can see, there are currently 56 uh, weed species resistant to glyphosate, which most of which are related to the um, cultivation of transgenic plants. Glyphosate already ranks, rank, ranks second uh, in the top 10 after atrazine, um, which has now been banned in the, U in the EU for almost 20 years. At the same time, the number of Bt toxin-resistant pest insects and uh, consequently also the resulting crop damage has also increased significantly, significantly and spread globally which is shown on this slide. Furthermore, um, as this figure only de depicts uh, complete resistances, um, there are also growing indications of um, reduced sensitivity to Bt toxins for other pest insects. And additionally, um, the period of this uh, development of resistance um, has also halved from eight to four years on average. And the causes for this uh, acceleration uh, a multiple resistance against Bt toxins and the um, long-term and uh, repeated <coughs> cultivation of Bt plants. <coughs> another um, uh, major problem is, uh, or uh, another indirect effect of the cultivation of Bt plants are secondary pest infestations since uh, the Bt toxins are only um, effective against a limited number of uh, pest insects, the transgenic plants are still susceptible to uh, many other non-target pest insects. So, <clears throat> um, uh, in addition to the uh, increased uh, uh, formation of uh, resistant uh, pest insects. This formation of secondary pest infestations has also become a major problem, uh, which increased uh, the use of synthetic pesticides and cost for farmers. Um, and the answer of the genetically engineering industry to this problem is uh, to, pro to produce plants that uh, produce several insecticides, uh, which are also called um, stacked uh, events and these stacked events are created by the crossing transgenic plants to uh, combine several traits and these plants then uh, have uh, multiple uh, resistance to herbicides and uh, are currently producing up to um, six um, as, um, insecticides and uh, uh, an example of this arms race in the field is the smart stacks maze developed by, by Monsanto and Dow Chemicals, which uh, combines uh, four GE events, producing six different Bt toxins, and uh, made resistant against uh, glyphosate and glufosinate. However, by stacking the inter intended traits, the risks and uncertainties of the parental plants are also combined, like, for example, a higher lo load of the environment, um, uh, the higher probability of unwanted interactions in the fields and in the harvest, and last not least, the cost for the seeds. And these stacked, uh, stacked events now account for the clear majority of global approvals, um, which are uh, currently 26, uh, sing, uh, and, and also for the import into the EU, which are currently 26 
uh, single events, shown in gray, and versus 17 uh, stacked events uh, in black. And the, these plants, including the harvests, are regularly contaminated with a cocktail of insecticides and herbicides. And due to, because of this um, um, cocktail effect can be synergistic, the possible health effects can exceed the sum of the individual substances. And uh, the, these effects can be triggered, for example, if the consumption of the um, products can change the composition of the microbiome in the gut, which was frequently shown by uh, glyphosate in particular. But so far, these uh, cocktail effects have hardly been taken into account in uh, risk assessment, um, since the EU does not um, request for empirical studies of the overall toxicity of the, um, uh, of the cocktails in the stacked events. Um, moreover, uh, these approved transgenic crops not uh, only uh, indirectly lead to the aforementioned uh, emergence of herbicide-resistant weeds, but they can also uh, spread uncontrollably, and for some plants, uh, they can also uh, become a weed th themselves. So this uh, slide shows the documented uh, cases of uh, feral, uh, of feral uh, plants and outcrossings into cultivated or wild species. Um, and in this regard, um, transgenic plants can also interbreed with each other and uh, subsequently uh, form uh, resistance against herbicides uh, against multiple herbicides, and which um, um, which can be shown can, can be shown on this slide. Another um, lesson learned is the contamination um, of uh, transgenic material as an economic factor um, via seed escape or pollen flow, hybridization of uh, transgenic plants and land races can form uh, po uh, hybrid populations, which after many generations of uh, hybridization and backcrossing can cause the introgression of transgenes <coughs> into the land race genomes, which uh, results in severe pro problems for um, uh, the conventional and, or and organic farming. And in Canada, it is uh, now almost impossible uh, to cultivate transgene-free canola, which was already predicted by uh, in a lawsuit filed by organic farmers against Monsanto and Aventis in 2002, which among, um, among other states, since it in its introduction into the environment of Western Canada, GM canola has widely proliferated and has been found growing on land on which is, it uh, was never intended to be grown. Another in, uh, more recent example from the Brazil, where large-scale transgenic contamination of around one-third of traditional maize varieties um, occurred, which is not only uh, uh, an economic but also an ecological problem since um, <laughs> Brazil is also a center for maize biodiversity. And um, finally, uh, another systemic effect of uh, food production and uh, plant breeding is the co concentration of the seed markets by patenting seeds and purchasing breeding companies, large corp corporations, which are actually primarily active in the um, agrochemical business, have uh, gained a um, dominant market position in the recent years. And this consists of four large companies, which are Bayer, Sinochem, and Corteva, and BSF. And these four companies now account for or control over 50% of the uh, seed market uh, of the com commercially traded seed market <laughs> and uh, about two-thirds of the global agrochemical business. And uh, by estab establishing transgenic plants, which are resistant to herbicides, um, they created a so-called techn technological lock-in um, uh, that um, they, uh, a techno <laughs> sorry, technological locked in um, and one uh, new business models of um, one new business model is no longer the sale of um, efficient and expensive uh, herbicides adapted to the um, uh, plants with uh, single traits but uh, 
in the marketing of the aforementioned um, um, stacked events, plants that are resistant to um, many herbicides. So with this, um, I will hand over to Christoph, um, showing why technology assessment is important also for the introduction of new genomic techniques. So thank you very much. What is um, round on old TE, so to say, transgenic plants? I will now try to introduce the issue of NGTs and technology assessment, some issues. And we found that many issues which are currently discussed on the risk assessment are also relevant for technology assessment, but also other issues which are relevant in here. So um, as already said, uh, we have a high technical potential to achieve genetic changes that cannot be expected from conventional breeding, which go beyond it. Uh, but these differences then also are relevant for risk assessment and technology assessment. And as a starting point, we should be aware that, in general, the NGT processes cannot be equated with those from conventional breeding. So we have misleading assumptions made, for example, also said to say by a German high-ranking high uh, scientific institution, uh, Leopoldina and DFG, which came to the conclusion that, after all, potential risk can only emanate, emanate from the modified traits of the organisms as a produ product of the breeding process, so from the product, but not from the process, and this apparently is, is wrong. And we should uh, look, have a look onto the process and then consider what is new about new, uh, what is really new about new genomic techniques and what is relevant for risk assessment and what is relevant for technology assessment. And um, mm -hmm. is this uh, slide is meant to uh, summarize some things um, which are different be between um, conventional breeding and um, NGTs. So in the end, uh, the site of the genetic change, the site of the genetic mutation, and the resulting combination of the mutations can be largely different compared to the one from conventional breeding. The um, NGT technology can overcome some um, natural mechanisms of genome organizations and therefore also affect um, regions in the genome which are especially protected, which are of high um, essential relevant for the plants, which otherwise would not have been changed or not likely to be changed. And also the combination of several changes in the genome, like deleting all gene copies in once, this you never would expect from conventional breeding. In addition, you also have a multi-step process, which leads to unintended insertion of transgenes, which is very likely to occur during the process, which you have to get rid of, take into account in risk assessment, but also in technology assessment. So, uh, on these unintended effects, like insertion of additional genes meant for, from the multi-step process, we have an example which is relevant for risk assessment and technology assessment, which is the hornless cattle, which you might have heard about. It's the easiest to explain, but there are same or similar cases also with plants. So, this hornless cattle was, uh, was um, achieved by NGTs in the U.S. It was shown to be healthy. Uh, by the University of California, uh, and um, uh, there were offspring, uh, apparently healthy offspring from these hornless cattle. Um, and in the end, uh, it turned out after some years that in the, D in the DNA of the cattle, uh, genetically the DNA of genetically engineered bacteria had been introduced unintendedly and inherited also to its progeny. And if um, there would have not been uh, adequate risk assessment, in this case, the FDA looked into the figures, then these cattle would have been used for breeding, and then these unintended effects might have spread uh, amongst thousands of cattle, uh, offspring, as it is the case with artificial insemination in cattle breeding. And then it would be have not only a question of maybe risks for the consumers, we don't know, or for the cattle, but also of economic relevance, because no cattle breeder wants to have in his cattle genome, or in, the, in the animals he's breeding with, wants to have introduced the uh, DNA of genetically engineered bacteria. So uh, if we overlook these unintended effects, this is just an example, they might spread quickly and easily and also accumulate by further crossings. So in the end, you might end up with a breeding population for plants or animals, which inherits um, genetic conditions, which you definitely want to avoid, but which were overlooked in the first days before it was uh, before it was assessed and, and, and authorized, and afterwards you never might be able to get rid of it again. So this we think is relevant for both risk assessment and technology assessment. The same is with extreme traits. 
So we have this huge potential to change the genome. Um, and in many cases, this depth of interventions is a highly potential instrument, leads to trade-off reactions, metabolic side effects, and these unintended effects, it's not an unintended genetic change, but it's an unintended effect, this can still emerge even in case where the genetic intervention is targeted and precise. And we have uh, the examples for, uh, on um, wheat, which is supposed to produce less acrylamide in, in, um, in, in use in, in baking, but this wheat in its extreme version is not able to germinate anymore. So you have a plant which produces kernels, uh, which uh, are supposed to be uh, healthier, but the plant will not be able to grow in the field at the way it, how it is expected. And this might take a long time. It's not only a matter for risk assessment. This also might take a long time for the breeder to come to a variety which in the end is suitable for climate change adoption, health issues or whatever. And this, of course, is a matter of technology assessment. Is the technology really delivering what is said? And is this really a benefit or is it a risk? And there are examples on fish and, and other plants. And, and also there are these side effects, uh, even if the genetic change is precise and is intended. And um, one major aspect, which so far is also largely overlooked, is the scale of releases. Um, we have the experience from our, current, from our previous mistakes we made with chemicals and, and plastics, that it's not only an individual product which raises the problem, but the uh, sum of the diverse effects on the, onto the environment, the sum of the toxic compounds released to the environment exceeds by far the uh, expected uh, impact of the single substances, which were assessed before. And so this is the same with NGTs. I will explain a little bit uh, in more detail. But this leads us to the assumption that similarly to the concepts of nature conservation and environment, environmental protection uh, which are largely based on the principle of avoiding intervention, that this is also relevant for technology assessment in the field of genetic engineering. We should avoid to interfere with the environment, with our technology, and only interfere to the uh, extent this is really necessary. This is the lessons learned from our mistakes so far. And we should really take them into account because when we look now mm -hmm, to the wide range of species, the various traits which might be produced in fast pace, in this in short period of time and also release into the environment. It's not only the organism which is taken into account in its interaction with the environment, but also the interactions between all these genetically engineered organisms which are not adapted by evolution. And so to summarize this, uh, we have a good predictability on the level of the genome, maybe to some extent, but the predictability is decreasing on the level of the organisms and on the level of the environment. So this is all a matter of risk assessment. This has to be dealt with, with EFSA, but it's difficult already for a single organism. But when it comes to the overall amount of organisms which might be released into the environment within a short period of time, there is no scientific methodology in place to assess these interactions and to predict them in a re reliable way. So this definitely is a matter for the risk assessor to be taken into account in, in advance before these organisms entered into the environment, how to restrict and control the amount, the number of these different um, stressors, which might uh, then act also with each other and come to exceeding, exceeding the, 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 the risk for the environment and the damage uh, if compared to the single events as predicted. So uh, the same is true with um, health effects, not only the environment, but also on the health effects. We have to be aware that Already now, we have dozens of projects dealing with weeds, with wheat plants. We have a dozen of projects dealing with tomatoes. And if you, for example, would eat tomatoes as a fresh fruit mixed in a salad, of course, all these mixtures might also then exceed on your health. And it's not only the vitamin D, which then has to be taken into account. It might be mixed with a tomato, which has a high content in GABA, and which might have a change in composition, like the, domato, the novo domesticated tomato, which really has a large uh, changed plant composition compared to the conventional bread tomatoes. And all this would then mix in a salad, as we do it currently. And then um, the sum of these effects might also exaggerate what we extend from the risk assessment of the single products. And all this is... As far as we can see, it cannot be properly dealt with, with risk assessment. This is also something which has to be done in advance to really consider where we are heading to. 
are we able to mix these routes in future in our tomato select in a safe way? So uh, on the radar, uh, we think um, beyond these effects which we now discussed, um, which are related to the effects on the plant or animal um, organism, there are other large uh, other issues which we have to take into account because if you would introduce it on large scale, it's not only affecting the characteristics of distinct crops or livestock, this will also have extensive impacts on food production system as a whole. And I try to shortly extrapolate. So we will may have disruptive negative effects, maybe also positive, we don't know, but disruptive negative effects on the precautionary principle. We are following it from this perspective, from the precautionary principle, from the protection goals. So we firstly consider these disruptive effects, which might have negative impact. So it, we might have a strong increase in fertilizers and, 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 and pesticides uh, if we have these super crops this, with these extreme traits. Um, and we will have these uh, disruptive effects on coexistence labeling and traceability for consumers and farmers, one of the major problems. This also, from our perspective, should be taken into account before introducing the technology into the fields. And also we have this disruptive effects on uh, seed production by patents. We see more and more patents being filed, not only on the technology, but also on the gene variants, which are relevant for the companies, which are uh, the target um, um, sites in the genome, which they want to change or which they want to um, introduce. And so it's not only a patent on the technology, but also on the biological diversity, which is be found in the wild species, in the wild relevant of the crops. And all these are taken out to the patent office, and this will not only affect the introduction of the NGTs, but also conventional breeding. So we have an overlap. If we introduce this technology into the market without being aware of this effect, which will, in the end, lead to a blockage or to a lockdown of traditional breeding, because nobody any longer can access the biological diversity which is needed by all breeders. And um, these patents also have <laughs> what we call in disruptive effects on science. Already mentioned, the Leopoldina has come to a, strong, to a strange conclusion, as we think. And uh, if we look to the experts which were tasked to uh, produce this report, um, most of these experts have strong affiliations with industry and file patents with bigger companies, so they have vested interests. And of course, we cannot ask these experts if you want to come to reliable conclusions to assess the technology in the long run. So now coming to the conclusions and solutions, which of course at uh, uh, this stage can only show the demand, the need for technology assessment, but not solve it already. That's it. Coming to the conclusions and solutions, there is an urgent need uh, for technology assessment since the introduction of NGTs cannot be regarded as sustainable if it may cause ecosystems to collapse, health risks to accumulate in food without notice, breeding being dis disrupted by patents, that companies do not have to provide detection methods, disabling organic or non-GE agriculture, and last not least, the end of uh, choice for the consumers. And uh, to prevent this uh, negative impact, um, there uh, has to be a prospective technology established that requires appropriate criteria to make fact-based decisions about the sustainability and potential benefits of NGTs in agriculture. And this would make it possible to identify negative effects on breeding, agriculture and food production at an early stage and to avoid that solutions through NGTs are becoming new problems for the environment, ecosystems and future generations. <coughs> And for this, we need transparent, reliable, and practicable, practicable criteria to distinguish trades with real benefits from those which are simply empty promises. And therefore, we uh, propose to improve the EU GMO regulation to th strengthen the precautionary principle by updating the risk assessment standards and introducing t t an additional technology assessment to estimate the overall impact on NGTs in agriculture and food production at an economic, social, and ecological uh, level. So the regulatory consequences for risk assessment would be to consider each, each event case by case, immediate and unintended, as well as immediate delayed and accumulated effects, and additionally to, to update the guidelines using new methodology like OMITs, Omics include and include cutoff criteria if in case if there are too many uncertainties. And for the additional prospective technology assessment, 
uh, it should enable it to uh, assess the uh, potential disruptive effects, which uh, uh, are mentioned before. And uh, on, the, on the other hand, based on a transparent and reliable criteria, it uh, should be enabled to assess the uh, real uh, potential benefits uh, in, uh, for each product that is, uh, will be put on the market. And uh, finally, so the decision making should imply two ind independent levels of scrutiny. That means that the market access would only be uh, uh, generated if uh, the both regulatory, regulatory processes come to a positive conclusion. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and invite you to further reading of our new report, which is now available in English and German on our website. Thank you. Presentation. Indeed, so the uh, new report is now available on testbiotech.org. And I had some questions about if you would also be able to share these slides because uh, some people were not able to follow everything and that's uh, always very useful. So maybe you can put them up on the website and tweet them as well so people can find them. And maybe just to uh, just one, qu uh, well, there were two similar questions in the chat online about why um, uh, Dr. Yu has went, went in such detail on the on the transgenic uh, um, uh, plants because these are not the NGTs that we're talking about. So maybe you want to address that a little bit. Also, I mean, the stack defense are not the NGTs. So why did you want to address this? Yeah, um, uh, we included this as a really big section in our report uh, to, just to uh, make it. Uh, uh, um, that you can see that what was missed during all these years um, with trans, uh, transgenic plants and which we should avoid to uh, now again be missed by, with the uh, new genomic techniques. Thanks a lot. Indeed, I think uh, uh, Dr. Tien said that also we have to learn from previous mistakes. So I think that that is a huge part of the report. Thank you very much for that. Um, there is... Uh, there's some questions also on, on the, uh, the, the, well, if the servers are basically not good enough to, to hack this. Well, we cannot, uh, of course, uh, fix server issues. So we can only recommend that you use uh, Chrome as, as the browser. That's, that's the best one to use. Uh, and um, yeah, that, that's all we can do is also what the technicians are saying. Um, we will have a short coffee break uh, and we will start at uh, approximately 10 to 11. I think 20 minutes should be enough. So we have some time for, for more questions also from the room uh, uh, and for, for the panelists. So first some coffee and I'll see you in 20 minutes. Mr. Neumeister, good morning. If you agree, we can quickly test your connection. <clears throat> Just test your connection from the room. Mr. Newmeister Lars, if you agree, we can test your connection from the room. Just press once on the speak button at the bottom of the page. Hello, I'm here. Unfortunately, it's a bit noisy here, but... Okay, now it's much better. I don't know what happened. May I ask you to say a few words, sir? Yeah. I'm, unfortunately, I had, I'm in a hotel room and there's a construction site, so I had to move to another room, which is also not really good right now, but you have to deal with it, I guess. Okay. So I had a really quiet room until they started construction. Sorry? 
we had a, unfortunately, I had a um, hotel room, it was really quiet, but then it started construction in the next house. Okay. So, as so I had to move now to another room, which is also not so quiet, but yeah. Okay, so for the moment, uh, the microphone is okay. Um, the only problem is the background noise, as you said. So if you can find a quieter room, a, a room where well, no one is disturbing you for will, your intervention, I will could try be to nice. It, yeah. We yeah, it could be because of the interpretation. So it will be more uh, easier for the interpreters to interpret yeah. your speech. That's all. But okay. everything is fine. We can see you. Yeah. We can hear you. Uh, the microphone is, com we can say, um, sufficiently okay. And um, so the only problem is the background noise. If you find a wider room, could be better for us okay yeah, the problem is yeah the problem is really the the, the construction is like on and off <laughs> sometimes they don't do it then they start again and so I, <laughs> it's i don't know if you can ask for uh for a room to the hotel i don't know uh yeah i will try that okay, okay thank you very much thank you, thank you.
So we want to start again. So we will slowly start again if every Okay, welcome back everybody. So we will continue uh, this event and we will now go to the uh, panel uh, discussion. So we have uh, a set of very good uh, experts and stakeholders in the field who will all have uh, uh, very relevant things to say. Uh, so we will give them the floor for five minutes each and then uh, perhaps some of them would like to react to each other or maybe there's some questions from the room or online as, uh, as before, just post the questions online in the chat. So first we will go to an online participant. This is Dr. Harald Koenig. He is a senior researcher in the technology assessment of ITAS uh, of the Karlsruhe Institute for Technology. And he has been involved in several European and national projects on synthetic biology, genomics, and genome editing, including process, uh, projects at the Office of Technology Assessment of the German Bundestag. Uh, Dr. Harald Koenig, uh, you have the floor um, for about five minutes. Thank you. And thank you also for the invitation. Uh, well, I think an important topic was the, the potential role or the need for technology assessment. And what, what was not clear to me from the presentation of, of Test Biotech was where at which stage technology assessment should play a role. So would, on the one hand, I got the impression this should happen during the approval process, during the market authorization for plants, for instance, and on the other hand, you mentioned this, this should happen even before to, to inform politics and, and the European Parliament or the Commission to how implement regulation, whether to deregulate or keep the current regulations. I mean, this, this would make an important difference. This is the first point I want to make to the technology assessment. The other thing, I think it was mentioned, the definition of technology assessment from, from, the, from the US governmental accountability office and there an important thing was that technology assessment should be open-ended or balanced how they call it. And, and I'm sorry to have to say this, but I, I think the, the presentation and, and, and the things how Test Biotech presented this is, gives the impression that the result of this technology assessment for, for, for these important issues and also which then lead to policy decisions, that the result of this technology assessment has already been made. And, and I think this contradicts crucially to our understanding of technology assessment, which should be an open-ended process. 
it should be an unbiased process and it should keep up options or, or at least give options to policy, both to the parliament and the commission with all the, uh, and discuss of course all the possible risks and benefits then, but also bringing up options and, and, and maybe also an important point is to keep up optionality, which we need due to the, the, the crisis we, we currently face and also the challenges we face. So this, this, this would something I wanted to say to our understanding of technology assessment. And the other thing I wanted to say is I think test biotech, how they see it, they are much too optimistic with respect to prospective technology assessment, what technology assessment can and cannot do, especially if you want to uh, assess single plants with respect to sustainability, for instance, as they rightly pointed out, issues like sustainability or, or all the experiences we had had on sustainability of previous applications of genetic engineering they, they all depend, of course, on the specific application, on the specific conditions. You culture such plants in different places under which conditions. Are there many pest, pest insect, insects, for instance, or are there not so many? Are the farmers trained? And so on and so on. I mean, I mean Christoph Thien mentioned this. And this, these are, of course, important points. But on the, on the other hand, this, of course, cause a, a great challenge with respect to how can you judge such economic effects or social economic effects, sustainability effects already at a stage of approval, looking at a single plan. This will be a, a great challenge, which I have not a good answer to, but I think this, this is, you demand too much of technology assessment with respect to this. And the other thing, of course, is even if you could and this, this refers to the criteria, which are definitely needed, but, but one thing one should keep in mind is that, especially with such a value-laden technology, with, with quasi-religious <laughs> notions on both sides on this, uh, it, it's clear that even if you, if you could agree on criteria, methods and so on, and this is also an experience from the, from, from the previous GMO debate, even if, if you could agree on this, all the results, all the facts you can measure, physiologically, ecologically, whatever you can measure, all those results will be judged against the backdrop of those different values and competing worldviews. And this is something which has to be taken into account. And at the end, of course, this is then a political decision. I mean, this is, this is very, very clear. And of course, technology assessment can can add something to this on a science-based levels, but technology assessment, has, as, as, as it was pointed out rightly, has to include many more things than, than pure natural science, because with this you cannot solve everything. At the end, it's a societal and it's then a, a political decision. This is, I think this is the few points I wanted to make there. Thank you very much, Dr. Koenig, uh, for this uh, very high-level kickoff of the debate. I saw uh, Dr. Tain uh, writing a lot during your speech, so I think uh, he will answer after we've heard from the other panelists about the specific questions. First, I would like to give the floor to um, uh, Ms. Rietje Raaphorst. She's a Dutch, uh, organic, uh, Dutch breeder and who is uh, the only one who is breeding organic maize has been involved in, in breeding a whole of her life and uh, she's here in the room. Grietje, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Uh, also, thank you for inviting uh, me here. Um, I'm Grietje Rapers from Nordic Maze Breeding and yeah, I also hear the echo. Uh, I started uh, working with, for and as a breeder in 1990 and um, I um, saw the, the introduction of the old GMO uh, uh, on the world. Yeah. Um, Nordic maize breeding has uh, started 20 years uh, ago. Uh, we are um, situated in the uh, north of the Netherlands. 
And when we started, uh, maize was uh, harvested uh, always in November. In uh, in that, yeah. Do I need to stop? Or? Yeah, I think it's a little bit uh, distracting us. There's a there's an echo, but now it now seems to be okay. solved. Yes, please yeah. uh, go ahead. It's it's gone. Yeah, I hear it. Uh, when we started uh, 20 years ago, uh, maize, silage maize was harvested in November in the north of the Netherlands. And we thought, well, we uh, that should be able to do better uh, earlier. So we started breeding uh, maize. And uh, in 2011, we had our first um, uh, ultra early uh, variety, which was mature uh, within a growing season of uh, 18 weeks. Um, uh, well, growing uh, that fast, uh, maize enables um, a seed production also. So I started to produce seed of our uh, maize varieties, uh, which uh, mostly I do organic. And um, our organic seed finds uh, a, the way to about one third of the organic maize uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands. So with uh, uh, early maize, we um, we uh, prove to meet a need, uh, at least in the Netherlands. Um, organic farmers are more used to uh, crop rotating. And also for that, we developed winter hardy peas, um, which enables uh, dairy farmers to uh, grow their own protein, which also solve, uh, will solve a, well, a kind of problem in agriculture. Uh, when I started in the 90s um, in plant breeding, there were uh, six companies in the Netherlands who, were, um, have, uh, who had a, a breeding program in maize, and now we are the only one. Uh, global um, breeding programs uh, aim at um, uh, effic efficiency and also on uh, high inputs. Um, regional breeding... Uh, gives opportunities for um, for making uh, the sector more sustainable. Uh, that's what we think. And um, it's not uh, one or two characteristics in a crop that uh, leads to sustainability, but the way crops are grown uh, that can be done in a uh, sustainable way. Um, well, we are specialized in ultra early maize. Crop rotating is possible, but also mixed crop with maize. We love to uh, have an uh, undersow of a cluffer mix in our seed productions. And the feedback we get from our farmers is that they uh, have uh, the seed production as a resting crop in their rotating. So I think I'm, I'm really proud of that. It's so nice to have a crop like maize, who is not really known for the sustainable growth. And then you get the feedback of your farmers that they uh, grow maize, our maize, uh, as a resting crop. So uh, that's, for me, uh, uh, well, a reason to <laughs> drop the question, why do we need uh, new breeding techniques as uh, if you look at crops in a different way? you can obtain uh, so much progress fast. So. Thank you very much, Gietje. I think you still have two minutes left, so maybe you could also address the question what um, what might happen or what you could fear uh, would happen if, uh, if there's some less regulation or even deregulation of these NGTs. Yeah, that's a good question, uh, Corinne. Thank you for... Well, reminding me of that. <laughs> um, uh, in 2011, we had our first ultra early uh, variety, and we, uh, um, together with another seed company, we had a, a well, a, a rather large seed production in Chile. Um, but over there, it got contami contaminated with GMO, so the seed had to be destroyed, and we lost our first ultra early variety. Luckily, we were knowing what we were doing, so we uh, went on. And now we have uh, one third of the market. So, yeah. But that is our risk. 
You know, I produce it in the Netherlands and with deregulation. Um, I don't know. I do not know how to protect myself. And it's the same with a patent, uh, patent and seat. Um, you know, we, uh, of course, we uh, take care of the, we, we provide the, the 150 meters isolation distance that needs to be taken. But, yeah, who makes sure that no one gets pollen into my seed production? You know, yeah. So that's the risk for seed production, but also for breeding. We also breed only in the Netherlands. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Um, good to hear that from the first person perspective. Uh, then I'd like to introduce uh, Klaus Behren from the European Commission. He is the acting director for Food Sa Safety, Sustainability and Innovation of DG Santi, who is uh, um, in charge of this NGT file, amongst a lot of other uh, business. Uh, Mr. Behren, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and let me first apologize for my voice. I, I woke up this morning with this <clears throat> sore throat, maybe out of fear of what is going to happen here today. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, so you have to forgive me that I sound a bit as if I had spent the night uh, drinking and smoking. Um, before commenting on the um, prospective uh, assessment and uh, the report, let me direct to, to a few statements that Ms. Österreicher made in her introduction that are, in our view, uh, simply not correct. Um, <clears throat> I mean, she had on one of her slides that uh, the, the, um, that our plant deregulation is driven by uh, the, the question of sustainability, and that is absolutely not the case. Um, what uh, we have received as uh, scientific advice from EFSA is that the profile of risks that can be uh, obtained in plants produced by NGTs is very diverse. Um, and that it uh, might very well be possible to adapt uh, the risk assessment requirements uh, to that. Um, and that is what we are aiming for, a proportionate regulatory uh, oversight. So I also do not uh, subscribe to this term of uh, deregulation. And then uh, the second uh, point is that we are portrayed as uh, a bit uh, starry, blue-eyed uh, believers of industry promises and that everything uh, is already a given. And that is definitely not the case. We have, uh, and the quote that uh, Ms. Österreicher used on the slide actually says that, that there is a potential that NGTs can help to increase uh, sustainability or contribute. That does not mean that it will actually happen. The proof of the pudding will be in the eating, uh, as uh, for, with everything. So uh, I, I think it's not fair to portray the Commission as uh, saying that this definitely will um, happen. And also our consultations that we have done uh, have been very, um, uh, very open. I mean, the responses to the questions uh, always ranged from uh, fully agree to fully disagree, including the slide, uh, the, the particular question on the possible contribution to sustainability, where you had uh, ticked the box, um, don't know. But it's, it was perfectly possible to uh, fully disagree with that uh, also. So that just uh, as a bit of a frame. And now to the, <clears throat> to the, to the report, which uh, we have, of course, uh, read with great uh, interest. And um, we are um, indeed interested in understanding better how such a comprehensive or prospective uh, technology assessment for NGT plants could be implemented in practice. And here I join very much... Uh, what Mr. Koenig uh, said, um, we, we currently do not see how this could be done in the uh, individual assessments uh, for uh, individual uh, plants, in particular in a situation where um, so far there are indeed none uh, on the market and released into the environment and there will probably initially also be uh, very limited numbers. So uh, in such a situation, how to conduct uh, such a wide-ranging uh, assessment is really not clear to us. And the report um, has also not provided very concrete proposals uh, in that respect. Uh, and Mr. Tain also acknowledged that, that uh, it's, it's not um, yet at that stage. 
Um, and uh, of course, we are interested to, um, to to continue the discussion and see what uh, can be taken up now or maybe integrated also later when there is a, a more um, experience. What also struck us a bit is why you um, see this need in particular in relation to uh, NGTs, or as your report was mostly about the transgenic uh, GMOs, compared to other technologies that are used in, in agriculture and in, in, in breeding. Um, uh, for example, uh, also conventional breeding uh, modifies the genome in the end, and in particular the, the random mutagenesis, which is exempted from the GMO directive requirements, but it's still... A genetic modification is used extensively uh, in breeding. So, Mr. Ho Mr. Hoisting, when you said that you've never had any contact with uh, genetic modification, I'm not sure whether you know uh, or whether you know with certainty that all the seeds that you've ever used have not been produced with uh, random uh, mutagenesis, uh, which uh, is among the, the, the accepted um, technologies and uh, out of the, um, uh, of the requirements of the GMO legislation. So um, we have, and I don't know whether this is known, for example, also, as a lot of the, the criticism was around herbicide tolerance, there are more than 400 varieties in the catalogue uh, of herbicide tolerant plants that have been bred with conventional uh, breeding. So this herbicide tolerance uh, problem is not specific to GMOs or NGTs. It is also happening in conventional breeding. And this, uh, what you mentioned, Mr. Tain, the uh, large-scale release of uh, modified varieties into the environment, this is also happening. Um, every year, there are more than a thousand new varieties uh, coming into the catalogue um, under the PRM legislation, meaning they can be planted. So there is a large-scale release of new varieties every year um, bred with conventional or with uh, random uh, mutagenesis. So... This um, assessment that you ask for would then also have to be uh, done for that, uh, strictly speaking, uh, because you could have the same consequences that you described, that there is interbreeding and then there is uh, breeding with uh, other plants that are in the environment uh, and so forth. Um, one little comment that I really want to mention in the report, uh, you specifically refer to uh, gene drives. Um, and here I, I want to clarify that this is uh, definitely not in the scope of the ongoing NGT initiative uh, because such organisms are uh, transgenic and uh, therefore uh, subject to the GMO directive uh, as today. Now, for us, um, uh, as I said, we are indeed committed to ensure safety. I mean, that's the, uh, the, the, the continued ensurance of safety is the primary objective. And uh, EFSA has, uh, in several opinions, uh, confirmed uh, to us that there are no specific hazards associated uh, to the NGTs that we are talking about in our policy initiative compared to conventional breeding or compared to transgenic, uh, transgenics. And this is also shared by a lot of other scientific bodies that I'm not going to mention here. And uh, we know that you disagree with that, Mr. Tin. And that's, of course, your, your, your right and privilege. Uh, but uh, obviously the Commission will have to listen to uh, and, and, and listens to uh, our official bodies um, for advice. So uh, to conclude, uh, for now, um, we are uh, indeed aware that depending on what kind of modification is made, the uh, possible risks are very different and need to be assessed. Um, and we are committed to build a robust system um, and including also um, monitoring provisions that will um, allow to see then when these uh, plants are finally uh, arriving and cultivated, whether there are these effects, these negative effects um, that uh, you uh, seem to um, expect. Um, and then, obviously, uh, as you rightly note, as a risk manager, we can always intervene uh, also. Again, even even authorization uh, or an approval has been given at a certain point. So um, we, uh, we welcome continued discussions on this, in particular on how this can be incorporated in the risk assessment uh, process. And uh, maybe as a last, as very last point, we absolutely also fully agree 
that the trade and, and it was mentioned in the in the um, in the slides also the trade itself is not a guarantee that uh, the plant the final plant will indeed contribute to sustainability and the example that you gave of the modified wheat that doesn't germinate uh, clearly uh, that's not uh, doing that and uh, here again, maybe it's important to recall that there is a second step. So after the assessment under either GMO or in future NGT, there will still be the requirements of the plant reproductive materials uh, legislation, the field trials to be done to show that there is indeed a value in cultivation, uh, which will indeed look at that. And uh, I think the um, uh, Ms. Um, uh, Rap uh, Rapos also says it depends on where the plant grows, what are the circumstances, what is the environment uh, in the end, and that is uh, indeed being checked also under the PRM um, legislation and will definitely remain. Thank you. Thanks so much for that contribution. Um, more discussion to follow, of course, uh, after uh, after we've heard from the rest of the panel. So first we go to uh, Mr. Torguna Kofut. I'm not sure I pronounced this right, I'm sorry. Uh, he's a farmer, also a seed producer, and the vice chairman of the Danish Agricultural Food Council and chairman of Copa Cajeca. Uh, the, the, the working party on seeds already for the last 28 years. Um, you have the floor for five minutes. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, the panel here, because uh, I think it is a very important uh, item. It is not the most actual uh, thing I discuss at the moment, but uh, the last two days, it is the IPPC report, and it is a really a scary report, because actually, if you look at it, in 2050, we have prairie and desert up to the Paris, south of Paris, and the south of Europe the steppes, uh, the half of Romania. It is our corn and food production. About 50% of our food production is laying in that area. So we have a huge problem or challenge how we can supply the society in Europe. I think, and the co Commission have already addressed that. Uh, I know that. And, uh, but the IPCC is a, it's a scary report. But uh, it, it means that the question about the NDT or not, it is not a question, it is a way how we can use it without a problem and how we can get this technology to be a good innovation and not a wrong innovation. And I, I, I agree that we have to look at uh, in the history what uh, technology has created and uh, what the correlate uh, technology has created of good and bad things. If we look at the uh, legislation today, we have a the best uh, seed law in the world, seed production law in the world. And it is uh, because it has created a lot of innovation because there's no way that uh, one breeder can block for another breeder. And, that, uh, and so if I have a good variety, you can t actually take my variety and make it even better. And this is basic of the European, uh, uh, of the PRM, what uh, the Commission just talked about. It is basic of how we are breeding programs uh, in, the, in Europe. And we must never give up that, no, we give up that uh, law instead of the patent system. Because the patent system, it is only a way where you are blocking things, and even it doesn't matter where you put the patents in. And to, with the new technology, it makes a, a big challenge because you can actually put in a patent on a small stream in the DNA, and then you have a, uh, then you can actually make a patent that you that mm -hmm. the farmers and everybody have to pay to that patent holder forever. And but the biggest problem is that. Uh, uh, that there's only a few companies who are who are applic make applications for the uh, for the patents, and uh, I think Christoph has a lot more information about that than I have. But it means that we have to look at what are we doing with the with the breeding programs. What we have heard about here today is transgenetic. Transgenetic. We have a legislation for that. The same with the cisgenetic. We have a legislation for that, and then we have a very huge, very expensive test program for these varieties who is coming to the uh, coming to the test. The biggest problem is I was part of the discussion of the GMO for 25, 28 years ago too. 
And uh, actually, nothing has changed in the discussion. It's, it's one thing. But one thing we have learned, all these promising they talked about they could do with the techniques, I haven't seen one of them. They should be able to make that, uh, that we could have very healthy plants and all these things they, uh, they promised to do with the technology, with the transgenetic. We haven't seen one thing. We have seen, uh, yes, uh, herbicide tr uh, tolerant and all these things, but we haven't seen anything what was good for the production. That's why we have put that to the side. But look at what the breeders, all the, uh, all the breeders in Europe, and we have a lot of small and medium-sized breeders in Europe. It's actually the most numbers of breeders in the world that are based in Europe. And uh, in the north of Europe, south of Europe, central of Europe, they are based in the area where we can produce crops to the farmers, the needs for the farmers. And uh, when we look at that, all these breeders, they are only making mutations. Traditional breeding, uh, uh, the random mutation and targeted mutation, they can do it, but uh, they are not, they don't have any programs for the, all the other things, uh, uh, targeted editing and targeted replacement and all these things, because they're just GM and they can't afford it. So, and we, if you look at, I have tried to ask what, uh, and what is in the programs by the breeders? It's only mutations. And they want to use the new technology instead of acid or instead of radiation. They want to use, for example, CRISPR or Talon to make the mutation because they, they are not in the size where they have the, uh, the competent people to make this very expensive breeding uh, for the uh, cis, uh, uh, cisgenesis and uh, transgenesis. They don't have it. So if we want to make a legislation in Europe, we need to make a split between the mutation the traditional breeding, and does, doesn't, don't look at the techniques they are using, because we have used a lot of different text and, uh, techniques in the past. Uh, and actually, in compared to the GMO directive, uh, we have, I, I don't know, maybe the Commission, know, but I think 80%, 80-90% of the varieties we are using today, they are in compared to what the legislators knew of techniques when they make the GMO directive. Then the uh, then the most of the uh, varieties we have today it is GM varieties because the techniques was not known at that time. But that's another thing. But let, let's make a split on the, uh, uh, with mutation. And with cisgenesis, it is a GM. It makes two good things. It is that we can make varieties whose better for the future. It's not a problem because it is only the DNA from the plant we are working it. Nothing come in. Nothing is taken out. It's only the mutation, the DNA of the plant. And if it could just grow in the nature, it will slowly turn back to the basic DNA of the plant. I can explain how, it, uh, how we can see it in, uh, in crops. Um, it's also make a good thing. So this, uh, uh, this, uh, these techniques will be used all over the world, and as most of it, it is mutations we see in the other uh, countries in the world. And these crops are coming. They are coming as wheat. They are coming as uh, as soya beans. They are coming as, uh, as faba beans. They are coming as all kind of crop. I am not sure, but I actually believe that we all are already have vegetables of where they have used. Uh, uh, the CRISPR cash. I have I'm producing uh, seeds of Brussels sprouts. I have done it for 20 years, and the, the fungus love Brussels sprouts. And uh, and uh, if we want to make uh, good quality seed, seed quality of the Brussels sprout, we need to protect it with the fungicides very much. But last year, I got a Taiwan variety, a uh, Taiwan breeder, and it was resistant to all the fungus. Why? They didn't want to say that, but actually, you can't prove it. You can't find it about anything. So, we need to make an intelligent technology uh, legislation in Europe. When you work with mutation, we need to follow the PRM because it is a very good legislation. All the varieties will be tested in two years. 
we can maybe make the test a little bit better. And if they can find some in, the, in these two years of growing in a, in a, in a variety test center, uh, and they are uh, maybe they uh, they think there are some cisgenesis, they could put it over to the uh, to the GMO directive. And if not, they just follow the PRM and they put it in the variety in the common catalog. And we can add something to the common catalog. It is which techniques they have used. They, we use it today when we talk about hybrids. They have to write which hybrid, female and males, we are using in a, five, uh, in a, uh, in a hybrid. So, so it is not uh, a problem to put that on that. If you have used a CRISPR, then you can uh, put it in the common catalog. And uh, if you don't want to use a variety where, where there's a CRISPR, then you can choose another variety. So it is, we have a good legislation. We don't need to change very much yet and keep the other things, transgenesis and cisgenesis, keep it, wait with it until we know what, uh, what they can bring with it. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very clear standpoint. Then we go to, uh, to an online participant. This is Mr. Leonard Bertels. He is um, the chairman of Young Organic Farmers Bioland from Germany. Uh, grew up in a tree nursery, uh, has studied organic agriculture and is now studying uh, politic, uh, environmental protection, agricultural food production. So very much aimed at the future. Mr. Leonard, you have the floor. Uh, Mr. Bertha, so you, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. First of all, I would like to thank Mr. Heusling, Mr. Durand and Mrs. Hasekamp for setting up such an um, interesting event. I think it is very important that we get those platforms to talk about this very important issue of, of NGTs. So thank you for inviting me to giving my standpoint or the standpoint of my organization in this round. So um, I think it is uh, common sense that we currently are facing huge um, issues and challenges uh, in the agricultural fields like um, climate change, like biodiversity loss, like the deg degraded soils. Um, yeah, we, um, we'll, we have to transform the agricultural sector uh, towards sustainability. And as sustainability represents a holistic um, system approach, we need to take um, as well holistic um, system approach to address these issues. We cannot address um, a system with single measures. So we have to always think from the system's perspective. Um, organic agriculture, as it is represented by my organization Bioland, um, offers a lot of answers to many of these questions of, um, of these uh, agricultural systems. Currently, we are, we are able to produce safe and healthy food without harming the environment to a, um, to a, to a, to a certain extent. But um, with this proposal of, of a deregulation of NGTs, um, it, it kind of describes an attack on the basis of organic farming. Organic farming is by definition GMO-free. Every organic farmer has to prove that his production, his complete uh, production chain is um, GMO free and for that uh, the labeling and traceability is absolutely essential and at the same moment um, each and every organic farmer um, carries the risk for what happens on his or her field. So also the costs if uh, contamination um, comes along. So um, I want to raise the question how will the coexistence of of GMO-free agriculture and GMO-based agriculture be possible in the future, independently from organic farming, but because it's also relevant for GMO-free conventional farming. Um, it has to be clear, and as it was said before, we already have a certain legislation that clearly defines uh, what is allowed and what is not allowed. We have a legislation that includes um, risk assessment, labeling, traceability, and um, it is proven, it is absolutely proven, it works. And I don't see the necessity to, to, um, to change the working um, system in this moment. Because um, I would say, and this is proven too, the vast majority of consumers and farmers all over Europe refuse 
this kind of agriculture based on um, GMOs. So we have to ask why uh, shall we do re re regulate? Um, I think it's not the solution to the current issues we are facing. Um, it would rather create more dependencies for all these small and medium um, farmers and, and breeding enterprises. Um, yeah, in the end, it, it, it describes another dead end in my uh, perspective for all these um, actors. And, and that is very important, uh, the freedom of choice for producers and for consumers uh, for GMO-free food is at stake in this moment. And um, with that, the trust and, and in the end, the whole integrity of, of the, the food system um, is, is threatened. And for that, we need answers to prevent, to get into this uh, possible slippery slope. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very clear. And then we go to the last uh, ex external participant also. Uh, this is Mr. Lars Neumeister. He's also from Germany. He's an independent pesticide expert who's been working on this field for 20 years already. And most recently for Foodwatch, he has authored a report on, on uh, especially this interlink between pesticides and NGTs. Mr. Neumeister, you have the floor. The invitation, so I'm presenting Foodwatch here today. Um, just to say something, um, Foodwatch has a campaign Exit Pesticides. And last year in June, we published a report Locked in Pesticides. And there's a pesticide reduction plan in that report, which shows you can basically free, pesti free European Union from pesticides until 2035. Um, pretty easy and you could have actually 80% pesticide reduction basically next year if you do a do crop by crop re reduction process. So um, NGTs crops don't appear in a report really except as a negative example um, because pesticide reduction needs regulation, it needs incentives. For instance, a tax for instance. So, and what we are worried about is really that the whole discussion about NGTs related to pesticides is basically only a distraction. So, because there was a uh, there is a proposal of a sustainable use regulation on pesticides, and this regulation will no, not, as it is right now, will not bring any pesticide reduction. So, and now, basically, the Commission, the European Commission, the farm lobbying are delegating pesticide reduction to the technology of NGTs. They are promising we are going to reduce pesticide use with those new crops. And this is not going to happen. I come later to that. And what is also important, this will not benefit the farmers. See, we have already a lock-in in pesticides. And if you look at, for instance, specifically back in history, herbicide use and use of growth regulators became really popular in the 60s, in a time where we had already overproduction. So in this technology, herbicides and plant growth regulators were mainly used to overproduce more and to lower the costs of production globally in the Northern Hemisphere. And that really led to the farm decline, to lower prices, the producer's prices are still sinking. We have a crisis right now with Ukraine, but in general, the producer prices of agricultural commodities are in decline and the farmers giving up. So I'm so the danger I'm seeing here if NGTs are really, let's say, in some point, I don't see it right now, honestly, I don't see any advantage right now. If they will bring a competitive advantage, then we have a slippery slope effect and all farmers have to use those NGT crops to be competitive. And this has to be taken into account into any risk assessment because the farmers, the non-adopters and the adopters of technologies, they have advantages and disadvantages. And if one technology offers an advantage, then all have to adopt. So there won't be a freedom of choice in some point anymore. So, um, so far, I don't see any benefit and I don't see anything that is, I, we did the report uh, for Foodwatch, from Foodwatch on the NGTs and I analyzed all these traits supposed to work on pesticide reduction and there's nothing. 
Most of the traits are working on viruses. We don't use pesticides against viruses. And there is, are traits on fungi resistance in some crops. But this is not significant use. And this is not going to work right, not in the next seven or eight, 10 years. I just talked to the project from Pilton Wheat. They want to make a multi-fungi resistant wheat. This is not going to happen in the next five, six years. So because they are still in a process of potted plants in the laboratory. So before we have any field tries, we cannot believe all these promises that you are made. So, and what Mr. Leonard said and Mr. Kofield said, we have really problems in agriculture, ecological and economic projects, problems, farm decline, overproduction, loss of biodiversity. NGTs are not the solution to ecological problems or to economic problems. We can solve these problems much more intelligent, much more holistic. And this is um, basically, yeah, this is what I'm thinking. And we need really a risk assessment for the NGT crops, which take all that into account. Also alternatives which already exist and which are already working. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Neumeister, for that uh, participation in this this first round. I think it would be worthwhile to do the round again uh, to give everybody the chance to to sort of react what has been said. Uh, and first, I would like to start with Mr. Ten, uh, because indeed, I mean, some questions were also posed by uh, Dr. Koenig about uh, uh, at where which stage would you like to see a technology assessment, and maybe are you not? too optimistic about its potential. So I would like to give you the floor. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And um, first of all, I want to like to thank all participants, all the those which came up with a controversial position. I think that's really needed that we try to exchange our positions in direct dialogue and try to find a way forward to um, identify the most relevant points and so I think this is quite useful to have all these different expectations and, and positions. So uh, from um, the points I've taken from Mr. Koenig, um, maybe it's important to underline that we do not think that technology assessment is uh, something which is meant to come uh, to a certain conclusion from the beginning. This is, of course, an open-ended process. Uh, for example, we describe disruptive effects in our report as positive or negative. Um, but uh, at the same time, we also see that industry and also the Commission is emphasizing the potential for sustainability a lot. And we are not aware of the scientific findings which would back that. So we put it into question. And furthermore, we are not following the perspective of those who want to introduce these crops into market. We are following the perspective uh, from the protection goals of uh, precautionary principles, the protection goals of health and the environment. And of course, this led us to another, um, an, an, another focal focus in, in our report, uh, if compared to other reports. But in the end, yes, we would agree, technology assessment is not meant to, um, to uh, prevent something uh, generally, but uh, to go over there open-minded and see uh, all the relevant points and evaluate them. And then we have the question on which level should we do this? And we already tried to introduce that as a prospective um, technology assessment, which should be at early stage. And um, uh, I'm, I'm aware of, of, of um, these um, kind of assessments have been done. For example, uh, with, with the, um, uh, also with the institute with Mr. Koenig is working for, uh, for um, symbio, uh, as a sim synthetic biology in earlier years, or also with nanotechnologies. All these um, technology assessments have been performed. There are methodologies in place um, to have a perspective, to have a, something like a map with all relevant points, and then uh, identify those which are most relevant. And this was never done with, um, the new, with the NGT plants and with the other NGT organisms which might follow suit because we are not, plant is not the end. We will end up with microorganisms, we will have animals, 
So yes, we should have this as, er as early as possible from a perspective um, uh, methodology, and this is available. And we are not the ones to predict what the outcome would be, but we just want to show it's necessary. And then we uh, are aware of other projects which are dealing with um, case by case the evaluation of um, technology assessment. And then yes, we think criteria are needed for a checklist or whatever uh, before these plants enter in the market because we see all these promises, we see all these species, these traits, um, uh, which might then be jointly released into environment. Now we say there are only a few, <laughs> but if we do not have the regulation right from the beginning, then of course this might increase rapidly, uh, maybe even deregulated, come to market only without any control. So we need a criteria catalog before uh, we um, are taking decisions on um, the crops which might go to the market or other organisms and there uh, was a question was raised also by um, the commission um, uh, how about um, uh, some um, some uh, criteria which we would need for um, commensal breeding and that there would be no difference in between commensal breeding and 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 uh, and NGTs comparing the risks and so we would reject this claim that there are not generic risks, there are generic risks, we argued them a lot. We do not agree with uh, EFSA saying um, um, that um, there are no unintended effects which are not relevant if compared to um, conventional breeding uh, methods, not different. Yes, there are different unintended effects. And we are aware of EFSA also saying we never had a mandate of the Commission to uh, evaluate these unintended effects. So we strongly disagree with um, the, with the um, with the commission giving the impression that there would be no generic risks. This is really wrong, and the commission is free to use all available expertise um, in peer-reviewed publications to come to their conclusions. And if they do not want to ask EFSA, they can ask us or others because the publications are there. We listed them, but they never were taken into account. And that's why we think, yes, we still need the same regulation in place for CRISPR, uh, because the mutations, the site of the mutation and the resulting combination of the genetic changes can be largely different. And before we say that's just the same, we have to look and approve and, 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 and investigate and examine whether there are other unintended changes. And if we do not come up with a proper regulation, then all these unintended changes might go to the next generations. That's what I tried to explain, which then is a problem for ecology, but also for economy. And if we are aware not, if we're not accepting this as a challenge, <laughs> then I'm a little bit scared um, about the commission and its task, uh, not having this radar, but just having, um, I don't know what, how to, to call this, a very st strict focus on some... Um, um, things which uh, they might uh, agree with, uh, and as I said, do not want to agree for political reasons, maybe for world trade issues, I don't know, for free trade issues, but we have to come back to the facts. And this is a fact that there are differences which have to be taken into account, and we cannot get rid of the current um, um, risk assessment, and that's why we also need a specific technology assessment for this technology. And also, if we want to have monitoring, we first have to uh, have a an, an, an regulation in place which really is um, allowing us to track and trace after the release. And this also needs, can only be provided by the current regulation. And, um, but we also agree that some crops from conventional breeding uh, might also need more assessment. We're not um, opposing this. We think in this case, it would be okay to have a look onto the products which enter the market, this is already possible now, which have a new quality. So having a product assessment of the uh, plants uh, derived from conventional breeding or random mutagenesis. Um, but we still think that the process is relevant for, for CRISPR-Cas and this leads us to this question regarding technology assessment and risk assessment. Yeah, I think that was the most relevant points of what I took note. And um, Yes. And uh, if we have the problem with international trade, we are very much aware of this problem and that it's, it's, it's not um, scientifically impossible to track and trace these plants, but that some information are needed and we would strongly um, encourage the Commission to take initiative on the international level for international register for these crops to be entered there and so we can track and trace them if they enter the European Union.
Did I forget something? It's just so I think for now no, it's fine. Too long thank thank too you very long. much. Uh, no, I think it's it's a very good uh, level of uh, detail of the discussion that we're having. I'm going to give Mr. Beyond a chance to uh, to react to this in a minute. But first, I would like to give the floor to MEP Hausling. Ja, Herr Behrendt, ich hätte noch ein paar Fragen, die Sie vielleicht mit beantworten können. Ich bin ein bisschen ent Yes, I think that there are some questions, as a matter of fact. There are some questions. I would like to know what your publication will be saying, the one by the Commission. So, if I understood correctly, you do a risk assessment after the release, and this would be against the, the European precaution principle. But uh, I think that you have another question to um, answer. As far as patents are concerned, everybody says we are for the new genetic engineering, but without patents. But it, all of them are patented, obviously. So how should this work for those companies that uh, put on the market the new products? Will they give up on patents? Well, it's hard to imagine that they will give up on patents. Is it possible without patents? Question mark. Will company on a voluntary basis give up on them? I can't really imagine this. Patents exist. And what uh, Rapost, our colleague, said is a huge uh, problem. Patents are already today a huge problem. How can we find a solution? And then we have an ecological right in the European Union for Mr. Beren. It's written that you should not be using genetic engineering, not even the new one. If then organic pro products are contaminated, I can sell them as traditional ones, but how can you solve the problem of coexistence if you don't have registers? How can you do it if you can't make this public? So it's the organic sector that should think about traceability, maybe. I don't think that this is possible. And already today, eh, it's very, very difficult to, to stay clean, let's say. And this concerns a lot of organic farmers in Europe. We have a political objective. We want 25% of uh, crops to be organic. Thank you very much. Indeed, I think that's a very good intervention. I think it is also uh, uh, very good if, if Mr. Behrendt would now like to, to react to the questions that have been posed and, and maybe also on the other speakers. Uh, and indeed also dis distilling a little bit also from here, I think the word holistic is, is what we're looking for also in your answer. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, let me start with Mr. Häusling's question. The first one, a bit polemic. I mean, you know very well that a few weeks before, and you say a few weeks, it's still, uh, we're talking about June, it's a bit more. I cannot at the moment say what the, what the proposal will look like. That's impossible. I mean, we're still working on it. Huh? So. Yeah, so we are still working on it, um, finalizing uh, the impact assessment, where, among others, we will examine also the likelihood of uh, NGTs uh, arriving on the market and numbers as far as we can make guesses and estimates about that. So this is part of the impact assessment, and I forgot to mention that um, uh, in, in, in my first uh, intervention. Um, I didn't say that there would be a risk assessment after release, Mr. Hosting. I said we will definitely foresee monitoring obligations, which is a different thing. The monitoring is to see, is that what was assumed in the risk assessment uh, before the authorization really happening in reality or is something else happening? And then we can intervene again. That's how it was meant. Not as uh, we do the risk assessment only after the release. That's really not what I um, intended to say. Yes, the patents uh, are indeed a, a big issue that has been brought up on many, many, many occasions. Uh, also here, of course, uh, from the colleagues uh, working uh, as breeders um, and the, breed the breeders' privilege. And that's definitely something that we look at together with our colleagues from uh, DG Grow, who are um, in charge of the, uh, of the legislation on uh, patents. Um, and uh, there are different possibilities that could be envisaged either clarifying notices or uh, communications, as has been done also for other issues around patents, or why not uh, also um, uh, examination of whether it is necessary to possibly amend the legislation. I mean, nothing is excluded. Um, everything uh, can be uh, studied. 
um, in because we agree that uh, the, the 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 breeders' privilege is something that is extremely important. Um, the companies, and I don't know whether uh, people here are aware, um, many companies using these technologies. Are, have set up a licensing platform also to facilitate uh, access to uh, patented um, uh, plants or DNA fragments or whatever is patented. Um, and at least uh, my impression is that most of them have an interest in making the, 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 the plants accessible. Uh, because otherwise uh, they they will not see a large scale uh, cultivation, which is ultimately also uh, their their uh, target probably. So uh, clearly this is on the radar screen, and um, we are looking at um, at uh, possible solutions. And then, uh, Mr. Heusing, uh, freedom of choice, yes, absolutely important. And you again said, how will this be done when there is no register? Who says that there will not be a register? I mean, uh, we've we've heard this uh, statement um, that uh, the, about the freedom of choice many many times. It's very high on our on our list of important points. Also, so uh, yes, we will uh, definitely find solutions uh, or propose solutions uh, for that. So again, your assumption that there would not be a register of uh, varieties created with NGTs, and uh, you mentioned how it could be done, for example, um, is clearly among the options uh, that uh, are being uh, considered. Now, uh, uh, back to Mr. Tien. Yes, uh, we know that you disagree with EFSA. Um, and uh, again, let me also uh, comment on the, on the claim that we never asked them to do a systematic review of uh, unintended uh, effects. That's not true. Um, we, uh, they, this was said, said by EFSA. This is it just called EFSA. EF, EFSA. EFSA put in an answer to you a sentence that uh, is read by you in that way. But in reality, when we asked them to update their opinion in uh, 2021, they carried out an extensive analysis of the most recent and relevant literature that is referred to uh, in the scientific opinion and in the public consultation report. Uh, in particular, EFSA examined all the literature provided by stakeholders and um, uh, they analyzed uh, in the recent uh, SDN 1 and 2 opinion uh, more than 150 uh, articles. And uh, for the opinion from 2022, um, on uh, SDN technologies, uh, they, EFSA retrieved 650 publications that were screened um, and uh, they also looked at patent um, and uh, following the criteria listed in a specific uh, protocol. So we still have full confidence in the work uh, shared by many, many, many other scientific uh, bodies uh, as well. But again, uh, I fully understand that you disagree with that, which is which happens also in other areas uh, in my work uh, that uh, individual experts or uh, several do not agree with a majority. I mean, we um, we know that. I mean, that uh, is not uh, unusual. Um, so um, I, I, I heard you say we need a we need a criteria catalog for doing this assessment, this prospective technology assessment. <laughs> Uh, very much interested to um, to indeed uh, get some concrete proposals in that regard, and uh, yeah. So the invitation to continue this uh, discussion, uh, and even if it's not all happening in the next few weeks or months, that's not the end of the road. I mean, there are always possibilities to elaborate and get better. Uh, in particular, when the details of the risk assessment process uh, will be uh, developed um, after adoption of a specific legislation, if it then happens, uh, because uh, it's in the hands of the Council and the Parliament uh, once we make a proposal, what uh, happens with that. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'd first like to go to uh, Rietje Raaphorst, also maybe on, on this discussion on patents and licensing. I think it's very important also to hear from you on this. Uh, and uh, maybe you wanted to react to the uh, other panelists as well. Yes, I, I first would like to react on uh, testing on, uh, of crops uh, before they are put uh, onto the market. 
because uh, in our uh, company career we encountered lots of difficulties to get our uh, varieties uh, officially uh, tested through VCU uh, because um, uh, our crops, uh, uh, because of their earliness, they differ that much from the standard uh, varieties in those VCU testing that our crops were <laughs> for many years uh, harvested too late. So uh, quality results were, were very low. So that, uh, with that, we encountered lots of, of problems to get uh, varieties through the, the official VCU testing you need to go through. Also with uh, heterogenesis, uh, uh, because um, uniformity is also needed for uh, putting a maize variety on the, on the market. And uh, because we work on a different uh, system, we work with three and even four-way hybrids. Um, that's maybe a little bit technical, but we do that because then there's more uh, genetic diversity in uh, the hybrid, uh, which, uh, to our opinion, is um, uh, in favor of the, the farmer. Uh, but we um, arranged a lot of difficulties in the, the official VCU uh, because also the big companies, they have uh, a lot of influence on how the VCU is performed. And another example we encountered some years ago from Latvia, uh, there was a organic VCU uh, organized for maize and Nordic maize breeding was the only maize breeding company that attended in that. So after th two or three years, the organic VCU uh, was ended uh, because of lack of uh, interest. And that cost us uh, more money because we invested it in it and we had to apply for the uh, conventional VCU again. So that's a point I would like to give to Mr. Berendt in account, really uh, be aware of how the testing of crops is being performed and who decide how the testing is done. Um, because our um, uh, experience is that the official testing uh, leads more to the same uh, uh, varieties and um, uh, really an innovative uh, var uh, var varieties uh, are eliminated uh, in, um, in that way. Thank you very much. Then I would like to maybe go to Mr. Kofu because also online there were some I think there was a little bit of a contradiction to what you said. On the one hand, uh, you you point to the danger of patents even on, on, on certain parts of the DNA. And on the other hand, you seem a proponent for NGTs, which per definition can be patented. So maybe you want to go into this question a little bit on how you see use of NGTs without hampering the breeder's exemption. Thank you. It's very simple because if I buy a combine, there are millions of things in the combine with patent. But when, when I buy the combine, I can use it for the purpose, harvesting. I can use it for clean the road with snow. I can use it for, ever, for everything. There's no patent who's blocking me for using whatever it is. They have used the patent to in, invent uh, a sensor, for example. But the sensor, I can take it out and use it for everything. That's why... When you make this patent legislation in here, you, you have, we have made the wrong decision when we made the patent, uh, uh, patent directive. It is that we, put, uh, we look at plants and animals like medicine, like biotechnology. We have to look at it as machines like robots because maybe you have a patent on the things you are inventing, but if you're using the, the, your invention to make a plant breeding, the plant breeders have to pay for that from the beginning, but there can never be a patent claim in the variety, because then we, when we, when, when then it would be completely impossible in the future, just after a few years, for other breeders to work with it, because there are thousands of patent applications in the plants, and uh, you need 
a lot of lawyers for small breeders to ask uh, how you can actually go on with your uh, plant breeding. And sorry to say that, even the, with the list of Pinto that the uh, Euroseat has made, it makes no help at all. So the only way it is that, okay, you can use a patented uh, technology uh, to make the breeding if you want to do that, and uh, if you want to do that, but still there are no patents. And then you will have at least... Uh, it will be on the price that the small breeders can be part of it. And then the other thing, if you follow the patent uh, legislation as it is today, we will have uh, no p choice uh, breeders' uh, privilege in the, fu in the future. And another thing, my fields as a farmer will be a battlefield for lawyers. Just look at the flower sector. So we need to take it. When we open up for these uh, patented uh, technologies, um, we need to make a add-on to the PRM that uh, when you put the varieties to test in the in the VCUs and PRM uh, and the DUS test, then there are no patents there, not at all. And another breeder can take that variety and go on with it. It is very important that we we do it in that way because else it will be the big four or five companies in the companies who, in the world who is controlling that se sector. And promise, I can promise you the seed will be more and more expensive because there are more people who have to live and pay to their investors uh, a good, uh, uh, a lot of money. And uh, we have to pay for all the lawyers. So what will the farmers do? Because we just, we, we try to take that uh, variety who make a good business for me as a farmer. And if the seeds are too, uh, too complicated or too expensive, we just make farm-safe seeds because we have a farm-safe seed legislation in Europe, so we can use our own seed. Uh, our own seed. So, and that way we will have no innovation. So it's very important that we don't mesh this breeding programs up with patents because it will not help any innovation in the patent sector uh, in the plant breeding sector. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I think that's a very stern precondition for any uh, loosening up of the uh, of the GMO risk assessment uh, and regulation. I'm going to look around also in the uh, in the room if there's any questions or contributions to debate. But first, I would like to start with Mr. Eisting again. Yeah, I want to answer because I cannot, I cannot accept it. We have a uh, look to the United States with patents. Do you want to have this system in, in, in Europe? No, we have a seed regulation that's free for farmers. And I don't think we can go in the direction that the United States go. And uh, as you say, it's no problem. I say yes, there are a lot of problems with patents in the future. And you see, on the, look on the market, only four big companies have a lot of influence for the whole market. Um, so I cannot <laughs> accept what you say. And one, one question to the breeders uh, or to the commission, uh, you say on the IPC, uh, situation now we have more influence of uh, the in the next uh, maybe 10 or 20 years of more drought and so on do you really think there are new with the new techniques we can say we have plants on the fields that don't use uh, more water how much uh, how much are now on the market we have a legislation in the United States. We have a legislation in, in China that is completely free. Are there coming plants on the market that don't use a lot of water? No, I don't see so. Yes, you would like to react, Mr. Kofit, please. Thank you. I didn't say, and I have never said that I am in favor of patents, not at all. I don't want patents in the plants. And I don't want patents to be uh, uh, the patent holders that my field will be a, a battlefield for lawyers. So we are at, on the same line here. I don't want patents in the plant. And it is a very clear position from the Copa, uh, Copa Cusiga. And the question about, uh, uh, about uh, the droughts, no, I don't, I, I, I don't believe that we will find a plant who can, who can grow without water. No, maybe... Only maybe we can see in the future uh, that we will have more drought-resistant plants. 
that they don't die out in, the dry, in a long dry period. The problem is for the most of the cereals and many plants, it is if they have a drought period for more than four, five, six weeks, they, they actually die out. Other crops are not doing it. But uh, I know that, uh, that they have worked for that for many years. I'm not sure that it is the NDT varieties who, who will be the first drought-resistant or more, more drought-resistant because I know that uh, some grass, uh, grass seed companies, uh, breeders, they have actually invented that, uh, that they don't lose a color uh, in, the drought, uh, uh, in the dry season. So they are very close, and it is with conventional breeding. So the breeding programs, as we speed up the breeding programs and let them use the techniques and only mutations. Again, only mutation because the other things we, we haven't seen that, uh, that, that they have any clue of how, how they want to help it. But we have to speed up these programs, breeding programs, so that we can produce more where we can produce. It is very important. And if we have a long drought, uh, drought season, then the, our crops, uh, they are not dying out. It is important. Thank you very much. Just to quickly react on an online question, if post-market uh, environmental monitoring is will be part of the NGTs, yes, Mr. Berend has promised us that it will be. Uh, and then I would like to give the floor to uh, Dr. Tin to react. Yeah, um, I wanted to come back to this um, accusation that we're just a minority of scientists disagreeing with majority. Um, I think this is not a question on the unintended effects. It's not a question of majority or, or minority. This is simply a question of asking the right questions to EFSA, for example, and giving them a chance to properly react. And the question which was never asked to EFSA is if there are uh, unintended effects which are caused by the processes by NGTs which are unlikely to occur from conventional breeding. And as long as this question is not posed and not answered, we cannot agree or disagree. We simply have to say the process is still not finished. You did not make your homework. And I do not want to um, uh, over uh, give an over-interpretation. But if you would continue that way, if you're not asking this question to EFSA and not uh, dealing with this question in an open-minded way, we get the impression that uh, uh, you do not want to have this question to be answered in a scientific way. You cannot refer to a number of publications. You have to uh, uh, address the correct uh, publications, which we gave you a list. So we think this is just an escape through, and we are afraid that maybe you think this answer is, uh, is already given from the beginning, the outcome of this consultation is from the beginning, that there should be no unintended effects of, of, of uh, NGTs caused in NGT plants by the process, because this would not, uh, this was not help to your agenda. This would not uh, be comp compatible to your agenda to take a par large part of these, um, of these uh, crops out of current regulation. So really give us trust in the process. Ask, we can give you some more of these questions which are relevant, but the most decisive question is, as already mentioned, please ask this question, please uh, let us know the answer, and do not try to, to preempt the whole process by assumptions which were never really uh, assessed in the, way, in, in, in the detail which would be necessary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tin. Uh, I'd like to give the, the Commission again the, the chance to, to, to tackle this unintended effect, but also uh, pose a, 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 an extra question, uh, something that also uh, Mr. Bertels raised about how, how do we um, align this with the, also the increasing ambition of, for organic farming. Uh, we have the 25% in the farm to fork, but also we hear some concerns about coexistence. So maybe you could address that as well. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think there's much purpose in pursuing this discussion. I mean, EFSA has told us on many occasions that, uh, and I didn't say that there are no unintended effects, that they are completely excluded, but that they are less likely to occur than, uh, for example, in, in random uh, mutagenesis. And, uh, as, of course, as part of the risk assessment, um, later to be conducted for the individual applications, the question of are there unintended uh, changes in the genome will probably be very relevant and to be examined also. 
Uh, now on the uh, on the coexistence, yes, this is and this is uh, also with the patents. I mean, this is also a very um, uh, important and difficult um, aspect uh, of which we are very much uh, aware. Um, and uh, what we uh, could foresee is that um, at the moment uh, the directive uh, says that the member states may. Um, put into place, uh, put in place uh, coexistence uh, measures or co-cultivation uh, measures. That uh, in our proposal we uh, reinforce that that it's one of the possibilities that it becomes an obligation. Um, and uh, maybe we can also, based on the experience that has been gained in uh, the few uh, member states where at the moment cultivation of GMOs is happening, yeah. Indeed, uh, based on the experience, um, uh, design some uh, principles uh, and, and, and criteria. But the details, in the end, we believe will have to be uh, set at uh, probably at a regional level even. I was at an event organized by uh, Baden-Württemberg uh, recently where, indeed, it was emphasized that the structure of agriculture in Baden-Württemberg uh, and, and parts of Bavaria and then Austria was also mentioned and Switzerland is very different from what you have in other areas uh, of the EU. So a one-size-fits-all um, solution from uh, Brussels will probably not uh, be uh, possible, but that this is an issue that needs to be uh, handled uh, and tackled, uh, is, uh, I would fully agree, yes. Yes, thanks a lot. Indeed, we look forward to that. Um, then maybe I'd like to go back to uh, to our online participants. Uh, Lars Neumeister, do you want to uh, add uh, and react to this discussion? Yes, thank you very much. Well, there's one, one aspect. If you look in the history of pathogens, and this is, is something we really need to address in a risk assessment, which goes much beyond the health and environmental risk assessment of a particular plant. And again, I'm going to stress a historic example here. In the, in the 80s, there was a disease in banana, the Panama disease caused by Fusarium oxysporum. So then the, the farmers reacted and changed the variety to, from Cross Michel to Cavendish, which is now the banana most grown in the world for the export market. So, so they solved the problem of the resistant variety. But all the farmers changed to Cavendish. And what happened? The next pathogen came. This is Black Zigatoka. So now farmers are spraying Costa Rica, Colombia, Ecuador, 50 to 30 times pesticides against Black Zigatoka. That was an unforeseen risk of shame. Or something similar happened with soybeans, with citrus, etc. There are new pathogens coming. And the problem here is if the, far let's say we have really the supreme NGT variety and the farmers switch to that, the risk that some pathogen comes and will attack that is really high. I, ca I cannot see that. We have basically a world trade of pathogens around with the agricultural trade. And um, we need to foresee that in a risk assessment somehow that a single variety cannot, well, like I say that genetic diversity is ensured in the future. So we have resilient agro food systems because this is really a risk and we cannot address it right now, but there has to be something looking much more into the future in modeling what happened to farming, what happened in the past with loss of genetic varieties, etc. So I really want to stress it out that risk assessment as we have it right now is not sufficient. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Neumeister. Indeed, I mean, that goes very much, I think, with the, uh, the plea of, of Test Biotech to do technology assessment, but also with the, the Farm to Fork report adopted in Parliament that we want a holistic view on the food system. So this is certainly something that will keep coming up, I guess. Uh, perhaps also uh, Leonard Bertels would like to come back also now that we've heard the Commission on, on the organics. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I would like to comment on, on Mr. Behrendt. Um, you said um, a register that contains all cases of GMOs in the future is possible. You are aware of that, you have that in mind and you will consider it. 
in the in the process of setting up um, a proposal i i think um, such a register that creates absolute transparency for all farmers and all consumers all along the production and consumption chain cannot be only an option it is an obligation it is an absolutely essential for the coexistence if we if we take this um, issue serious the coexistence then we need um, a proper labeling without a proper labeling you make um, european farmers the um, experimental laboratories of, of these big um, in multinational um, breeding companies and that is absolutely essential that we have um, I mean, right now we have this kind of labeling and we need it desperately also in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the Commission took a lot of notes. Yes, the, it's understood. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Kofut would like to react. Thank you. Just to mention how, how the practices, we have a transparent system. We have all the varieties we are using, except the heterogeneous. All the varieties we are using, they are tested before they are coming in a common, common catalog and before they are coming in a national variety list. So there is a transparency. The only thing we need, if we, if there, we have to deal with the NGT, it is a way where we have to list the NGTs in the common catalog. Then we have the transparency. Another thing, how we spread these things. We have a coexistent legislation in Europe. So it is, it is there. So just, and the farmers know to uh, use this coexisting uh, rules if they have to uh, have to have their neighbor crop with the same, uh, with the same crop. So, uh, so there is a coexisting law and all the seed producers, producers know that. It is the truth and, uh, and it is a practice. We know that. And, then, and another thing, it is that how does this new variety spread? We have, uh, I don't know, agricultural crops, we have about uh, seven, 800 new varieties every year. One variety, a very huge variety, will ha have maybe one and a half, two percent in a one, two years period. After that, it's dropped down to, to lo lower than one percent. So we have thousands of variety in Europe, and still we only have about 40, 45 percent of the farmers who are using new varieties every year. The rest are using farm safe seed. So this disaster then uh, with new varieties. I think it, we have another challenge. It is that we have to learn the farmers to find, to use these new varieties if we want to have the good quality of, uh, of food in the, in the future, especially uh, when all the fungicides uh, is taken away from the farmers because the varieties we know today, they are being contaminated with fungus every year. And the fungicides actually produce about 40% of the uh, of the cereals today. If we use it, if we take them away, we are losing. We don't have enough food in Europe. It is a it is just a, the reality. So uh, again, try to look at the reality in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, yeah, Grietje Rappers would like to comment. <laughs> Yeah, I would like to react uh, to that because to our experience, coexistence does not work. Uh, it does not work, really not. Yeah, uh, I reminded that some years ago we wanted to work together with a uh, Canadian corn breeder who is also uh, GMO-free, as he stated. So we, uh, we got some material uh, from him. And we had it thoroughly tested on GMO. And even though he convinced us that it was GMO-free, there were traces of GMO. So there was no cooperation uh, um, uh, possible. Uh, he luckily, he is uh, working with one of our varieties now in, uh, in Canada. But it's, it cannot be the other way around. So coexistence, to our experience, it's not even an opinion. It's our experience does not work. And if it will be, um, well, implemented, um, I would really like to know who runs the risk, who is paying for it, and not only in euros. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Mr. Heusling would like to come in. Ja, ich wollte nur mal erinnern daran, dass das Patentrecht kein europäisches Recht ist, also kein Recht der Europäischen Union. 
Yes, I'd just like to remind you that uh, the right on patents is European. So this is an important point. And then another aspect is this, this matter. If the Commission says, OK, let's have a register. But I remember very well the discussion with you uh, do, at the Commission. I remember very well the European Commission said that basically you cannot do tests. Uh, and so basically you can't even have a register. So uh, let's leave things as they are, as they are now. And... Uh, Every farmer knows very well what to do, but this is in contradiction with what that's be, with what's been said by the Commission, because this cannot be demonstrated on the plant. So we need to put a label on the plant or on the seed. This could be a possibility. And then if you say that member states should regulate coexistence, do we have a European um, uh, law or legislation for organic uh, crops and then other 27 rules for coexistence, another 27 rules for coexistence. Well, I can't really imagine this. So for the Commission in the coming weeks, I think. But first, I would like to go back to uh, Dr. Har Gönig, um, who, who started off uh, our, our panelists, but uh, maybe he would like to come in also uh, reacting to some of the answers of Dr. Tain and also on the other panelists. Dr. Gönig? Yes, now I think we can hear you. Ah, Please go OK. Ahead. Yes, I mean, there, there are a couple of points, I think. I think the first one coming back to reality, both from a science-based and, if you wish, also technology assessment perspective, but also from a legal perspective with respect to proportionality. I think there, there is no way to regulate those technologies, or at least no way which would make sense or would be meaningful for, for any party to regulate those new techniques in a one-size-fits-all uh, manner, because the changes you can introduce are so, so different and ranging from things you can really compare to, to, to random mutagenesis up to things which may harbor risks, as, as Mr. Tain pointed out, yes, but one has to take them into account. But, but to me, it seems that those risks have to be looked at, or, or also those techniques has, be, has to be looked at in a very, very differentiated manner. And, and, and then for the reasons I, I mentioned, both si science-based reasons and, and and, and legal reasons like a risk-based approach or, 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 the, or the proportionality principle. I mean, this is the reality. There could be no one-size-fits-all thing. This would make it neither politically sense nor this would make scientifically or from a TA perspective sense. This is the one thing. The other things which, which came into my mind with the banana example, I mean, this is an example that, for instance, the, the reduction or, or, or that people rely on a single on a single variety has not necessarily anything to do with GMOs or NGTs, and this is again an example on the special on the special conditions you have always to look at, and I think this is also something TA in politics should do to look at the special conditions and and then come to differentiated solutions or differentiated options. Against this is an argument against the one one-size-fits-all regulations. And then, of course, there were the, the critical points. I mean, this is clear. The patent issue is, has to be solved. But, but patents, of course, I mean, the reality in patents is the licensing. How is the licensing organized? And there, there, there could be innovative solutions, for instance. Uh, for instance, that, uh, that there are incentives that companies give those licensing things, which would be comparable, uh, compatible with the uh, with the plant variety regulation, for instance, as Mr. Crawford mentioned. So, so 
there might be options for this. And, and I think the hardest problem, this, I think this came also out of, of the discussion, is the coexistence. Who, how can one prevent that, that just uh, the farmers or the organic farmers will, will carry all the risk? Of course, there could be registries and, and things like this, and, and tracing should be possible. But to, to my knowledge, there is no good method at the moment. And, and the one which came up, which people already thought you, you, you can even prove uh, point mutations, I think this in reality does not work that good or that easily. So, so I think a critical point would be, yes, of course, you, you, you would have to implement methods to trace this really. Otherwise, I think this, this would be difficult to convince farmers or organic farmers that they have trust in such a system. So I think those methods have to work in reality that in case you, you could really trace this and, and, and look for this. I mean, this is, this is a real, real problem. This has to be solved. Yes, I think this, is, this would be my comments. Thank you very much. And you cannot see the room, but there was a lot of nodding at the commission side. <laughs> uh, I think um, I, we have to sort of wrap it up. So I'd like to give uh, Christoph Ten uh, one more time for shortly the word. And um, uh, I think that that <laughs> needs to be okay. And a short, short comment. Yes, go ahead. So um, on the issue um of the patent law, we have to be aware that, of course, the European Union is the one who first allowed patents on plants, and that's European uh, European Union law, the European Patent Directive, and the European Union should therefore also be aware of how the European Patent Office is uh, using it. And currently, we see that what was meant to allow patents on technical inventions is used to pa patent plants and the biological resources. So I think this is a matter for European Parliament. And on the other issue with the one size fits all, this is uh, of course not something which, <laughs> which uh, can be um, discussed on several levels. What we say is that, um, that the current publications available, um, uh, peer reviewed publications available show that we still have to look for all intended and unintended genetic changes as required by law. And yes, we think this is required for all plants derived from these processes, because this is what, what science tells us if we really look to the, to the research and not to uh, assumptions <laughs> made from it, which may not be correct. But then, of course, if we have this, that's it's already in the current regula regulation, that if you check for intended and unintended <coughs> effects, the next steps in risk assessment will depend on it. So there is always a way to, um, to, 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 to find a way not to request something of, uh, on risk assessment for plants, which apparently is not adequate. This is still pos already possible under current law and can be adopted currently. The EFSA, EFSA already has several guidances for several cases. And of course, we would um, expect that there would be a specific um, guidance for risk assessment of these plants and that this risk assessment of these plants is adopted step by step but starting from the intended and unintended effects. But it's all inside regulation and not outside regulation. That's what we want to convince the Commission not to give up a system which was established well and which is flexible and which can be adopted to the new plants and just take it for fragmented in a way that it's no longer working properly and no monitoring can be, and no coexistence. It's all depending on the current regulation and I have to be short. And uh, finally, on this licensing platforms already mentioned, um, patents. Uh, of course, we have to be aware that licensing always is meaning to be dependent on the patent holder. And the farmer's privilege, the breeder's privilege currently, as established, gives them freedom to operate without being dependent on any patent holder. So this cannot be a solution for the future. But this, I think, was already mentioned. Sorry for repeating it. Thank you very much. I would like to give the panelists in the room one sentence to close it up. Worked really hard. Yes, okay, thank you, uh, Karina. We'll take that in account. But I would like to share um, something that um, happened a few weeks ago. I was invited uh, by a group of a European academy who is studying uh, intellectual uh, pro property, um, also for this case. 
And they asked me if uh, we, uh, we as Nordic Maze Breeding would uh, license our um, varieties. And I said, no, we as Nordic Maze Breeding, we feel uh, completely protected um, with the plant breeders' uh, rights as uh, the situation is now, as we thought. Um, uh, but they mentioned that uh, the possibilities of the ACLP um, they uh, um, organized, uh, but we are not willing. Um, we, we don't see any use. And um, furthermore, I think that with uh, uh, platforms like that, I think that we as Nordic Maze Breeding, we are really the last... Um, small breeding company who has started breeding in silage maize. Uh, if you want to start from scratch, the first thing you have to do is go to a pl platform as ACLP, as is stated, and you have to talk to the big companies who have patents. So um, I've um, asked uh, if it was really true <laughs> at the Plantum, uh, and they said, yeah, the current situation is that the, uh, the freedom of breeding is limited right now. And, uh, well, we, we said to each other, we have probably living under a stone <laughs> because we didn't know it. We bred from the beginning with the feeling that we have the freedom to breed. But it, is, uh, it has been limited uh, already since 2017. Thank you very much. Mr. Kofut. Thank you. I will make it short. <clears throat> we have to keep the breeders privileged and take, uh, keep the patents out of the plants. Then we will have the most broad innovation of the plant uh, breeding programs because a lot of people can be part of it. Don't look at the techniques because now we are talking about new, new uh, genomic techniques or CRISPR Cash or Talon and all these things. About one year, we probably have two, three new technologies, the light or whatever they do. So, the breeding programs, we need to let the breeders uh, look at all kinds of possibilities to make breedings, but we have to look at what are they doing. Are they only changing the DNA of the plants? It's okay. If they are adding anything or they are putting something into the DNA, we have to look very careful, uh, carefully. And we have legislations that we don't need to make it weaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Concluding remarks from Mr. Beyond. And given that you're already over time, maybe I just limit myself to uh, thanking everybody for the very, very interesting contributions. And uh, even though we did not have the full spectrum, the total full spectrum of views that we have received via all our consultations, it was already a broad spectrum of views. And uh, yeah, we are very mindful of these hot topics that have also been mentioned several times uh, today. Um, and we'll try to come up with a proposal that will address them in the best possible way. Thank you very much. And then I would like to give the floor to Martin Heisting for really concluding my remarks. Yeah. Also, we have ja, we have ja recht. We have a, a, a legislation that should not be uh, amended or modified, uh, jokes apart. Uh, if uh, the uh, Commission wants to do that, uh, then uh, they should provide us with the answers that were not provided uh, today, the coexistence uh, and uh, patents, and these are important aspects because this will be heavily affected uh, if we take the right or wrong direction. Then it was said that there are very many conventional breeding solutions that can give us the answers, but um, we are getting answers uh, that uh, had no questions. Do we need the new genetic engineering techniques? Uh, you might need them. I don't. In Europe, we must be happy that we moved in a different direction vis-a-vis -vis the Americans or Latin Americans. We still have a seed industry. We still have a possibility and the freedom to choose. This is something that we should be protected, defending. I remember 25 years ago, 
or 25 years before we started uh, discussing the about the old genomic uh, engineering uh, uh, they told us they will, it will come uh, it didn't come to europe and we do not miss it so i do not want to have further problems new problems schafft dies immer für neue there is no science for new genomic techniques, but there is also a science which is very much critical uh, of these new technologies. There are very many scientists who are critical uh, vis a vis this topic. So let's keep discussing. I will wait for your proposals and we'll uh, keep on discussing. Uh, we'll be meeting again when your proposals will be put forward thank you to all of you all participants in person or online 140 people uh, have attended this meeting so thank you to you all for your interest thank you to all those who contributed uh, with their inputs and also thanks to our moderator and you to all and have a nice day and also thank you to our interpreter Translators and also a big thank you to Astrid, Elena, and Kalina for the organization. Well done. Um, and, I mean, we will continue discussing, I guess. Thank you.